So welcome again, uh, welcome in Norwegian. Um, I am Ingun Grimstaklet, and I think Ingun will be more than enough for today. We will have a lot of names and difficult names for many. I am a professor of clothing and sustainability at the uh, consumer research at Oslo Metropolitan University in Oslo. So that's a rather long one. Uh, but I have been working uh, with Norwegian wool uh, for very many years. Um, and um, together uh, with Tone Skorda to be also written a lot about Norwegian wool. And we have also contributed and worked together with others and trying to save and to develop uh, wool in other countries, not only Norway. It's a lot of things to do in the area of wool. Yes, here in uh, Norway or in uh, near Oslo, where we are, it is a very, very great day. So it's a, great, a good day for this um, webinar, I think. Um, and uh, before we start, I will tell you who is paying this and why we have decided to have a webinar like this. Uh, the story is like this. Um, uh, we, uh, and that is not only me, but also Selby Spineri and uh, Tone um, and Lisbeth, uh, were in Poland uh, on a closing um, conference on a project that was founded by the same grant type of grant that has founded this webinar. Um, I'll tell more about that later, but anyway, this was a webinar about wool. Um, no, it was a conference about wool in, in Poland, and it was an impressive, um, um, big event. Um, and um, the volume project was about Polish wool. And we tried to find better uh, use of it, and we also worked with how to develop a better value chain in Poland. And then at this webinar, no, at this conference, we actually met two ladies that we really liked. Uh, we liked their um, talk, we liked them, and we liked uh, the story uh, about Slovakian wool, which we didn't know anything about. Uh, so we thought um, this might be a good start for a new project, maybe something like what we have already done in Poland. Uh, and I have still uh, the yarn from this uh, from this um, event. I couldn't resist, you know, couldn't resist it. Also, the marketing I liked. You see, it is it, it, it's not familiar to us. It's it's kind of uh, we could see it was from another country. And I must also admit that it is so many things I don't know about Slovakia. Really, I'm I, I'm kind of blank. And I think that is not only me. So I think it is high time uh, that we have new friends from Slovakia. And um, we will come back to that as well. Um, the, it, it's, it's like uh, I have to tell about the money uh, because this is um, um, this uh, uh, when we asked for the money, it was um, uh, um, submitted under the bilateral uh, relation fund for cultural uh, program uh, and culture. Cultural is important. This is not industrial, for instance, it's cultural. Uh, and it is uh, founded by the Ministry of Investment, Regional Development and Information of the Slovakian Republic. Uh, and the grants are coming from the EER, Norway and Switzerland. That is kind of money that is between two countries. Uh, and uh, in this case, Slovakia and Norway. And the time from we under, that we realized that it was possible to ask for this money and when it closed down was very, very limited. And that's why we decided on the webinar because we thought that we can do short, but good. Uh, so that is the story why we decided and then we realized that we have a lot of um, things in common uh, in uh, in our wool history 
and not everything, but a lot, and also in the way that history and national costumes uh, are present uh, today. Uh, and as you see, I have dressed up for you uh, with uh, a kind of Norwegian sweater uh, with its roots from our national costumes. Um, it's like uh, in Norway, the word national costume or another English word um, called costume uh, is not exactly what we are talking about. So I guess that during the webinar, you will hear another word and that's the Norwegian word, and that is bunad. So we will try to start with some, um, some um, language uh, discussion first. So bunad, I think you have to remember, that is the outfit we are talking about when we are talking both about national costumes and, uh, and uh, uh, traditional rural costumes, but also how we use it today. So it's like a broader um, definition. I guess Karianne will come back to that in her presentation. Uh, and then I think also that uh, we are talking about wool today, and in Norwegian that is ull. Uh, so it's quite similar. And we, I guess we will also talk a bit about spel, and spel is the old breeds in Norway. So it's like spelsau is old breeds, uh, ull is wool, and bunad is this costumes, but more than that, a bit more than that. Yes, uh, I now want all our Slovakian um, participants to be greeted in another beautiful language uh, than Norwegian. Uh, so I think then that uh, Alena will continue um, talking. Uh, um, so we also have like a flavor uh, from Slovakia before uh, we start. So, hello to all. <laughs> it will be Lubica talking. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's Lubica uh, like that will be, uh, do that. Yes, sorry. Uh, so, I, I will greet at first uh, all the English speakers. Hello, <laughs> and thank you for coming. And um, I will now speak a little while in Slovak so that uh, I tell uh, everybody in Slovakia the necessary parts. <laughs> and you can enjoy the Slovak language. Takže vítam vás všetkých zo slovenskej strany alebo aj Slovakov z Norska. Sme radi, ak sú nejakí tu s nami. Kľudne nám napíšte do, do chatu, budeme to sledovať. Uh, takže zhrniem vám len na začiatok. Uh, ďakujem za privítanie Ingun. Um, a poviem vám nejaké potrebné veci k uh, technike a potom celý príbeh, ktorý je za týmto našim uh, webinárom. Takže prvé upozorňujem, že webinár bude nahrávaný aby sme uh, mohli potom celé to video spracovať. Uh, budeme sa to snažiť otitulkovať a dať uh, postprodukcii na YouTube, aby sa k nemu mohli dostať aj ľudia, ktorí nemohli byť teraz online a vedieť, vedeli si to pozrieť do záznamu. A aby ste mohli uh, rozumieť, o čom sa hovorilo aj tí, ktorí nehovoríte veľmi dobre po anglicky. Takže keďže je webinár nahrávaný, Uh, prosím vás, uh, kvôli GDPR um, pravidlám, pokiaľ by vám vadilo, že bude váš obrazok vidieť, môžete si vypnúť dole v ľavom, uh, dolnom rohu uh, kameru, aby sa nenahrávalo video. Uh, automaticky celé obecenstvo, všetci návštevníci uh, majú vypnuté mikrofóny, a keď po prvom bloku uh, bude diskusia a po druhom po obednom bloku bude diskusia, tak uh, vám všetky mikrofóny zapneme, aby ste sa nám mohli zapojiť do diskusie a povedali nám nejaké svoje postrehy a nápady, ve ktoré budeme veľmi radi. Um, takže uh, vítam vás ešte raz všetkých veľmi srdečne. 
Um, postupne vám predstavíme všetkých uh, prednášajúcich a všetkých účastníkov, ktorých uh, tu máme. Máme uh, na dobedie uh, uh, vedami z Úluvu a uh, dámu z uh, Norského muzea, ktorí nám budú hovoriť trošku viacej o tradícii vlny, uh, uh, tradičných uh, kostýmoch a krojoch uh, v Norsku aj na Slovensku. A po obede sa presunieme trošku do témy súčasného spracovania vlny a budeme hovoriť o malej predjarni v Norsku, malej predjarni na Slovensku a nejakých ďalších vlnených projektoch u nás na Slovensku. A trošku k príbehu, ako to celé vzniklo. My sme sa s Alenkou ktorou máme svoju vlnenú značku Mokoša v Slovensku a ako e, zastupcovia občianskeho združenia Naša vlna sme sa v najesen zúčastnili e, konferencie v Poľsku, ktorá sa volala Vulium a bola partnerskou konferenciou medzi e, Univerzitou v Oslo a Univerzitou v Poľsku v Jalsko Biala. A na tejto konferencii sme stretli kúzelné norské dámy, s ktorými sme sa zoznámili a zistili sme, že máme samozrejme veľa spoločných tém okolo vlny a chceli sme vytvoriť nejakú spoločnú platformu, kde by sme mohli tie vzájomné vzťahy trošku skúšať, porovnávať, zistiť, či vieme vlastne nadviezať nejakú funkčnú a efektnú spoluprácu. A keďže nám prišiel do cesty tento projekt, ktorý je vlastne financovaný z norských grantov, EG grantov pre Norsko a Švajčiarsko a pod hlavičkou vlastne ministerstva informácie regionálneho rozvoja na Slovensku, a bola tam veľmi kratučký čas na prípravu a pomerne ako malá suma, tak sme sa rozhodli pre tento online webinár jednodenný, do ktorého by sme ale aj tak narvali veľa dobrých informácií. A chceli sme vlastne preskúmať jednak, čo sme mali a máme spoločné v histórii, lebo keď uvidíte vlastne prezentácie tradičného textilu a použitia vlny vlastne v tradičných krojoch a oblečení, tak uvidíte, že sú tam nejaké veľmi pekné podobnosti. A takisto sme chceli potom, aby sme to vzali ako do súčasnosti, tak sme chceli trošku um, sa inšpirovať vlastne norskou stranou a, a procesom spracovania vlny u nich, kde tá kontinuita uh, stále zostala, kým u nás teda nezostala. <laughs> a uh, zároveň je na oboch stranách veľa nadšencov, ktorí sa do toho procesu spracovania vlny uh, zapájajú. Na Slovensku je to momentálne veľmi náročný proces návratu vlny naspäť na, na trh a na nejaké zmysluplné spracovanie, takže by sme veľmi radi, aby z toho webinára vlastne vzýšli nejaké inšpirácie, ktoré môžeme vziať na Slovensko a aplikovať ich nejakým spôsobom aj tu. Dobre, myslím si, že to je zatiaľ všetko. Budeme teraz mať teda prednášky a potom budeme mať teda na stej obedovú pauzu. OK, so I'm returning the, the words to England. Yes, thank you, Lubika. Uh, and uh, thank you for speaking Slovakian. That I think is the most I listened to in uh, Slovakian in my whole life. Um, and I think that was on high time. So it's my idea that it, this should be in Slovakian and, and, and not only in English, because English isn't our language. It's, it, for most of us, English is a struggle. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that this is about cultural change and language is a part of culture. A very important part. Yes. 
So um, we will start um, the first session. Um, it will be three uh, presentations and after that a discussion uh, and after there a lunch break in one hour as uh, planned. Um, and um, uh, I guess you understood everybody that uh, what Lubecca said, uh, but she told the same story uh, I could understand uh, about uh, how we met and also how we we liked each other. And she um, is uh, together with Alena um, 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 running a brand selling Slovakian wool, and you will hear more about that later today. Yes, the first speaker is from. Uh, Norway, uh, and this presentation will not be in Norwegian, it will be in English. And this is Karianne Pedersen. And she is, like me, educated in ethnology uh, from uh, the university in Oslo. And for very, very, very many years, she has been in the lead of the na uh, of the national costumes uh, department, the Bunad, uh, in our biggest um, museum in Norway, taking care of our uh, history. And uh, uh, Karianne uh, has also been very active uh, uh, discussing um, Bunad and uh, also talking about it and embroidery. Uh, she's, is, she's very, very skilled uh, with her needle and had have a collection of threads that is amazing. So uh, I have known her uh, for so long time, but I really haven't heard her speak about this. So I am looking very much forward to it, Karianne. The, um, then we can, you can share your screen and I will unmute myself. Thank you, Inge. Uh, it's it's a bit scary for me to uh, to speak here because I've never been on a webinar before. I've been much too busy at work, and <laughs> we haven't had time for stuff like that. But uh, I'm trying to. Um, we talked about uh, wool embroidery, uh, wool thread used for embroidery. So that's what I'm focusing on. Um, in this talk. I also have a video in it someplace. And if it if the video doesn't work properly, I'll just jump over it because it just shows activity. Um yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh Ingun mentioned bunads and uh, bunads are a very integral part of Norwegian culture. Um we were um for um 400 years under Danish rule, the Danish king, and from 1814, when the Danish, when the Danes uh, had supported Napoleon and had to give Norway away because they lost Norway, um, uh, we became, uh, we were in a union with Sweden until 1905. So uh, we were just, we've just been an independent nation since 1905 completely independent. But at that time, it became very important for uh, us to um, show that we were uh, proud of our own heritage, to put it that way. This I'm showing this, um, first of all, this postcard, because this Hardanger costume, this costume that you see here is from the very picturesque valleys in the western part of Norway. And they, it was used as a sort of national costume very early on. And uh, here, this is a procession of women dressed in their local costumes from the western Norway to celebrate that uh, the Germans were out of Norway in 1945, the victory celebrations. Uh, uh, Bunads are, in very constant use in Norway. I think we at least have 60% of Norwegian women wear a bunad or own a bunad. And this is a protest group. They call themselves the Bunad Gorilla. 
and uh, they're just protesting because they are closing down maternity units in uh, hospitals on the west and northern coasts of Norway. So they uh, dress in bunads and protest and make a lot of noise. And so the bunad is a sort of symbolic thing that also can give a certain extra clout when you are uh, doing something. Otherwise, it's used for um, family celebrations, the national holiday, uh, weddings, baptisms, confirmations, that sort of thing. Um, the the person who actually got us starting to use the bunad as a sort of symbolic uh, countercultural item uh, after around 19, 1900 was this woman, Hulda Garborg. And she was uh, an author and um, part of the movement that wanted to give make Norwegians proud of being Norwegian and not being under other big countries and so on. And so she took the uh, national, the, the local uh, folk dress from Hallingdal, which is another area in Norway, uh, and uh, redesigned it to be um, uh, sort of modern and at the same time countercultural. Here you can see a beautiful little girl. Uh, this this was the bourgeoisie. They were also dressing in these farmer clothes. So Norway has a very weird uh, uh, way of, of using these clothes. I know that when, um, I mean, uh, very few other countries have uh, a tradition that you dress up as farmers did to celebrate uh, high occasions. You can wear a bunad to the to balls at the um, at the palace if the king invites you. It's that it has that big status. Uh, here you can see this. These are from around 1905. Kids were dressed up like that, and uh, and grown ups too. And as I said, 60% of Norwegian women at least own bunads, and uh, only 6% is in Sweden. So it's a very part of our everyday life. Oh, oh what happened now? Yeah. This is uh, the area um, I work on, which is Eastern Telemark. Um, it's uh, two hours drive uh, west of Oslo and it's a very picturesque area, very touristy area. And uh, uh, these costumes are inspired by the old uh, folk dress, but they're made uh, and constructed or designed in the 20th century, in around the 1915, 1920. And this uh, uh, is a, a costume from the 1950s, which uh, is like the very early ones. And it's used, uh, this woman has inherited it from her mother and things go, are get inherited. And also, um, so it's a very important piece of value in a way. Uh, what fascinates me is that women, this is a, of course a constructed uh, photograph, but they don't usually sit in their costumes embroidering. But um, if you can see the, uh, the women who are doing this are very, very good embroiderers. It's uh, Helen and Anlauk, and they um, uh, they do that for their family. So they make things like this for their family members and as a sort of value and inheritance to get give on. If you have to buy the whole thing, it's handmade and so on, it can be very expensive. Oh, this is the... This is the video. I'm hoping it works. Doesn't seem to work. Yeah. Uh, this is a typical activity uh, on um, locally. You have the handicraft groups. This is a group who meet once a week in um, in a place called Evie in Telemark, and they have this embroidery cafe. So they sit and share. Uh, experiences and insights, and they do um, 
um, work like that all the time. They make things for themselves or maybe they sell it to other people. And this sort of activity is going on. Um, I must say that I'm not so very happy about super professional people uh, just thinking of making money about this, but because we have this thing, Norwegians have been disciplined into knowing that it needs to be good quality, so you have to pay for it. But now we have uh, lots of people who want to uh, make a profit without actually delivering the quality that's necessary. I want to, here I, would, I don't want to talk about that. I want to show the, the local and the private or personal working that people do, which isn't connected to any economic um, things. But you also have that, the, um, how can I put it? Um, the stores, the shops that uh, deliver yarn and so on, uh, are doing a thriving business because lots of people want to make their own things. Um, typical here is that in a few minutes, uh, a few moments, a woman is shown, she found uh, some embroidered stuff in a, in a box at home and she came here to this uh, group uh, to see if they could help her find out what it was. Is this something I can make a costume from, or what is it? It's This is the Mari who's uh, trying to find out about this costume she found. And uh, so even though things have been, yeah, there is a lot of activity. That's why I wanted to show a video. And uh, people are, lots of people are quite nerdy about this and are enjoying a lot of uh, communication and fun. Other people are, of course, there's a lot of discussion too, but uh, um, what is the correct thing? What is the culturally correct thing? What is the traditionally correct thing? Is there one way of doing something in a tradition or are there many solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think I'll say goodbye to the video there. Oops. Yeah. Uh, the blue knots are sort of a bit uniform today. They are, um, you have sort of special models and people are very afraid of doing something wrong. But what fascinates me is going back to the folk dress, the traditional folk dress, the way it was used, and looking at that. Can... Okay. Uh, I didn't know how much time there was, so I had to check. <laughs> um, and uh, the examples from Eastern Tale. Mark, here is an example of men's clothing from 1780 to 1830, very, very early. And you can see the man has, uh, this is the red waistcoat with arms, waistcoat jacket he has underneath, and then a white uh, on top. And just look at the details. This is the details here on the embroidery. You can see the photo to the left. The thread is very thin and it's very, um, shiny and this is made by uh, the cover the decor as it's called in Norwegian what the spell so the outer layer the outer co the cover coat I think is called when it comes to wool um, which is uh, stiff but it's not completely hairy in the the, um, the spell so because it's um, it can, the Spelshar sheep has two specific layers of wool quality. The fine undercoat is very soft and the outer coat is coarser and sturdier. But both qualities can be felted. So the outer coat isn't just like hair, to put it that way. 
I choose to use the term cover coat yarn to describe the yarn used up until the 1850s in Norway. The name used was Kamelgon in Norwegian. And I wondered what this had to do with camels. The explanation, of course, is simple and has little to do with any exotic animal. It is derived from camel or camel in Middle High German from the name of the Angora, now called mohair, goat's long neck, which resembles that of a camel. That's why it's, it was called camel yarn. Um, and um, some of it is very shiny. Some of it might be mohair, for all I know, that was imported. We don't know. Here's the woman's uh, uh, similar dress. And you can see the, the embroidery here is also very detailed and the, the embroidery is very thin with very thin thread. If you see the apron to the right there, that is dated 1812. It's a wedding apron from 1812, which is privately owned. Uh, the women's dress was, uh, you used a belt, which was tablet woven. And the older ones before 1850 have very, um, thin, shiny yarn, not very elastic, uh, which of course was called camelgon. Here is the embroidery on a similar man's jacket and you can see uh, it looks like it's even thin the thread is and how open. When they embroider, they also didn't embroider thickly. They embroidered so you can see the the um, um, material underneath and that way you, you get a sort of movement in the embroidery it, it shows the the threads give you a sort of special movement that is something that really fasc fascinates me here is a woman's costume from the same period and uh, the main focus for uh, the, what they were working were shirts and in they could use up to four shirts inside each other as a status symbol. So there are heaps of these collars still existing in Telemark and uh, people sort of have them lying in, in their um, drawers and, oh, we have this from grandma. It's sort of, there's not much you can do with such a, an embroidered collar because uh, you, you can't sort of use this as a, as a rag if you see what I mean, uh, when things are embroidered, they take care, they are taken care of and people don't throw it away. Uh, at our museum, we have about 300 shirts, all of them different. And uh, it's the same at the museum in Telemark and also the Nordic Museum in uh, Stockholm has a lot still. After 1850, something happened with the yarn. Um, and um, I think it has to do, I'm, I'm sure it has to do with uh, the phenomenon we call Berlin Woolwork, which was that Berlin was a center for the printing of embroidery patterns uh, in the 19th century. To begin with, they printed it on, um, you know, so you could see the, the cross stitch embroidery. And then it was hand colored to show the, the colors you, you were to use, or you could do that yourself. Uh, later, they printed with color and people could buy uh, separate sheets of uh, embroidery so that, or, of a pattern. So it was cheap to buy. And the wool that they used for this was um, soft, and totally different from what had been used in Norway from before. Um, Germany's yarn made from soft, smooth Saxon merino fleece was brought to the greatest perfection in Gotha Saxony, is stated in um, um, an article about uh, Berlin Woolwork. Saxe Gotha in modern day Turinga. 
Merino sheep originated in Spain and until the 18th century, their export from Spain was punishable by death. Wool production was regarded as that uh, valuable. The first large flock of Merinos was sent in 1765 by Spain's Ferdinand VI, um, 1713 to 1759, to his cousin, Prince Xavier, the Elector of Saxony, who uh, lived from 1730 to 1816. When the Germans crossed the Spanish Merino with the Saxon sheep, the offspring's fleece was finer and denser than that of their parents. By 1802, Saxony had about 4 million Saxon Merino sheep, and German wool was considered, according to Annie Frost's Lady's Guide to Needlework from in New York in 1877, and practically best used being of superior finish and dyed in more lasting and brilliant colors than any other. Berlin wool, or Zephyr as it was known in Germany, came in three weights. The coarsest was called double, the intermediate grade, um, single, and the finest split. Um, this Zephyr yarn is what uh, became what they started using for these belts to the folk dress in Eastern Telemark after 1850-60. And it was called Sifegon in Norwegian. And it's very elastic, the old yarn. It's as if you can, you, you can sort of pull it. It's, it's extremely elastic. The yarn we get today isn't by far the same, but uh, People are still weaving these belts, these tablet woven belts. They can be up to 13 centimeters wide, which is an enormous amount of tablets and stuff. So I can't weave, so I don't know, but I just see how much work it is for people and how hard it is. Uh, but of course the old uh, belts are the most uh, sought after, but they're not so easy to get by now. Uh, the cutoffs, when people were weaving belts, there would be uh, pieces that were cut off in the end, you know, it's called, um, yeah, you know what I mean, the, the small pieces. And uh, what we can see is that these, it was this quality yarn they started using on these vodmel stockings. This is the side of a a vodmel, a wool stocking made out of wool material. This was what women used, women and men used at that time, all through the 19th century, actually, in uh, in Telemark. And these, um, you can see the, the wool is a totally different quality than the one you saw earlier in the embroidery. And it's thick and it's made, um, it doesn't, there is no opening between the threads so that you can see the bottom anymore. It's made in a bit, a sort of different way. Uh, they could also, especially look especially at the bodice. Well, those are two backs of bodices and you can see the bodice to the right, how carelessly it is embroidered. This is everyday clothing. They just have the pieces of wool and then they just do this. The one to the left is quite a lot. It's very nicely embroidered, but most of these bodices that still exist, it's on cotton material. The the material is cotton and the wool is embroidered on quite well. You wouldn't get very good marks in a handicraft uh, class with that sort of embroidery. Um. What the, this is uh, attempts at reconstruction of the historical dress by uh, really interested women who do this as a hobby and uh, passion. And they um, have woven their own belts. They have sewn their own stockings. You can see the stockings to the to the right there. These are the Vodmel stockings. They're very comfortable to wear. 
I must say I love them much more than nylon because they are so uh, comfortable. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. Uh, I, this is what I think is interesting and more and more people are getting to be interested in doing this. Um, and um, we also have a project going at a school with 13 year olds who are sewing their own costume and learning to do it in a very simple way and they're getting very interested and uh, one of them is starting has started to weave her own belt and she has to have it finished until May 4th because that's her confirmation. So uh, this getting people to do more themselves by hand is some of the things I think is very important. Have I gone over the time? I'm sorry, I'm finished now. Thank you so much, uh, Karianne. Uh, so now we have seen how yarn can change the embroidery. Uh, and I guess that it was uh, a word that maybe was difficult for some people, and that was mavadmel. Um, Karianne mentioned oh, many yeah. times. And I think in English, they Badmel. sometimes it's call called... it homespun. But uh, maybe vadmel it's is... Called vadmel. Uh... It's called vadmel too, in, yeah. in uh, English. Yeah, but it's not it's sure that everybody thick... understands it. But yeah. anyway, it is a uh, uh, felted and woven and then felted, so it's stiffer and thicker. Mm -hmm. But um, and then I also wanted to mention a little a little detail because we have worked with 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 wool also with the with the, with Portugal, uh, and then we realized and this uh, merino story that when we are talking about that the merino came from Spain uh, at that time. Spain and Portugal was Spain. So it's not only Spain uh, mm. talking about it. And that is very interesting in, from a Norwegian perspective, because in many, you know, 400 years, Denmark was also Norway. So when things comes from Denmark, it could have come from Norway. And that's uh, something to just uh, clarify, I think. Yes, okay. thank you so much. And our next speaker will be from Slovakia. And then I think I'm not going to do the introduction. Yes, let me do the introduction. Um, yeah. So our next speaker is uh, from a very similar area than uh, Tariana. And um, we have this wonderful institution in Slovakia, uh, uh, which is a center of uh, folk arts produce. We call it Ulu, Ustredje Ludove Imolatske. Hirobi. And uh, it is an institution that works for many decades now, has been working for several decades now, and uh, it tries to concentrate uh, the traditions of uh, folk produce. Uh, so textiles, uh, woodworking, um, uh, wire, uh, all kinds of uh, traditional crafts. And it uh, tries very much to support also the folk producers or the people that uh, are uh, still doing these traditional crafts in Slovakia. And um, our next speaker is uh, Radka Janačova, uh, who is a director of the uh, museum of this institution and we need an expert for this uh, textile. Tradition. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. I will do my best to give you introduction to our folk costumes. And share my screen again. So, do you see it well? Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> OK, thank you. So uh, apart from flex and hemp, sheep wool was the most widely used for the textile production in Slovakia. The sheep was domesticated in our territory in the Stone Age, but its hair was not suitable for the spinning, and therefore felt was um, probably the first textile. 
The wool was gradually refined and by the Bronze Age, it was possible to weave threads for it and to process them in the fabrics. Our earliest finds of remains of woolen textiles and finds of string scissors for sharing sheep date from the early Iron Age. Other finds from the Great Moravian period allow us to assume that processing of the wool into the thread was part of the culture in our territory of the time. Wool processing influenced shepherds during the Wallachian colonization from uh, 15th century to the 20th century. The breeding of Wallachians breed, which was the most widespread breed, uh, in our territory began the spread in our territory. The wool was processed in countryside by domestic workers and in towns by craftsmen. So here you can see the process of combing and uh, hand spinning, which was called uh, druganje. Wool as a material was mainly processed in these three ways. Uh, unique method was uh, guba or gubarstvo, which is a traditional way of making wool coats. Um, wool was uh, used in many products, clothing, footwear, accessories, hats, or bonnets in traditional folk costumes. And guba, or gubi in plural, they were made of the same name woolen fabric with long strands of sheep wool woven into the wrap. They were worn over the Eastern Slovakia and were primarily men's clothing. Women wore them only especially. The usual guba was white, the more rare one was black or gray. They had simple straight cut, which seemed across the chest. The neck placket was coarsely furnished with the red woolen cloth. Under the throat, it was tied uh, with a pair of woolen strings. So you can see uh, here is the object from our museum. And this is the reverse of the fabric and on the picture you can see how it was made, the long strands moving into the wrap. And also um, object from our museum, here you can see the really simple cut, it's made only from two pieces of fabric. Another type of the garment was Havana, which were made of uh, sukno. And sukno is the plain vein fabric with fell surface. They were worn in the southern regions of Western and Central Slovakia, and Haleni were worn by men. The characteristic features of them was a white collar hanging down by the back. Haleni were decorated with wool embroidery. Due to high consumption of wool, they were an expensive piece of clothing. On festive days, they were worn just draped over the shoulders. The sleeves could be sewn up and served as the as the pockets for belongings. A unique type of clothing was hunya, uh, worn by both men and women. And the characteristic features was a diagonal seam. seam. They were colorless and usually decorated only with colored woolen cords. This is uh, another example of it, by wearing by men. This is the simple coat made from sukno with a simple straight cut. Uh, wool was used for almost all parts out there. So here are some examples from our museum. 
and this is a woman's coat. Uh, it is embroidered also with wool threads or woman's skirt with bodies. I think it's a little bit similar to what uh, was in the presentation before. Ben trousers also embroidered with the wool threads. Men's vest. Uh, other um, footwear, an important uh, use of wool was the manufacture of footwear. Several types of footwear were made from wool, either from cloth or by knitting from yarn. Men and women wore the same types of shoes, but uh, differing only in size and decoration. Women's shoes were more decorated, uh, woolen shoes were worn mainly in the winter. So these are women's wool slippers, also embroidered with the wool thread. And some examples of the shoes made by knitting, uh, they could be uh, combined with the leather shoes, is the middle picture. Another example of embroidery. Accessories from wool uh, include scarves, which women uh, usually wore tight over their bonnets. Uh, scarves were made from really thin and fine threads. Different kind of belts, woven belts. Uh, gloves, uh, where are the essential part of clothing, especially in mountainous region of Slovakia. They were woven on the woven wooden mold or mold like this, which is made from wood and the threads. A typical part of men's clothing uh, in some localities in Slovakia were wrist warmers called zapestky, which protected not only uh, from cold, but also protected uh, from accidents while working with the wood or sharp knives. So this is from our museum and uh, on the picture you can see how it was uh, worn. It also uh, used for tied the sleeve of the shirt. Wool was used in various forms and was also part of the example wedding crowns uh, worn by brides to their weddings. So this is a example of this was on the top of the head like this too. Wore by brides. The production of heads was also important. Um, heads from order or for sale were, were originally made by the town hatters for cloth, later from felted sheep's wool, which they dyed black. The forms were adapted to the requirements of the fashion of the time, while the products from the rural popula population were mainly adapted to the region's customs. In traditional culture, the head was often used as a dance prop. It was most often used in the dance called Odzemok, in which was the place. It was placed on the ground and the dancers dance around it and threw it out and etc. 
but it was also used in dance games, for example, in the bear dance and the Chirac dance, in which the dancers threw or drop heads over each other. Head dances occurred particularly throughout Slovakia. So these are other examples for woolen heads. This is the groom's head decorated uh, with the feathers or rosemary, which was usually for the grooms. And married women always wear bonnets in traditional costumes. Um, bonnets were not made of the wool usually, but in some regions of Slovakia, they could be embroidered with the wool. So here are some examples like that. This is the wool embroidery. And I put some uh, pictures of embroidery also on the other material than, than wool. So this blouse is made from linen and it's embroidered with the wool. And also this uh, sheet to cover the dead body is made from the cotton and embroidered uh, with the wool thread. And on the... And also some examples of bobbin lines because wool was not only used for the for the sewing but also for lace making. So I think that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's 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 so amazing to to look at both familiar and so also so so different. Uh, especially, I would would say this these woven mittens and and uh, and wrist warmers. Uh, I haven't seen uh, maybe I mean I'm not a specialist in folk costume in Norway, so I don't know. But I haven't seen it, and and uh, it was uh, it made sense to me in a way with with stronger than than woven. So thank you so much, and uh, I think um, we will go on on uh, with more from Slovakia, uh, and now more on the sourcing of the wool for this work. Uh, I guess uh, Lubica would introduce the next one as well. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Radka. It was very interesting to see how. Um... You know, it always fascinates me the similarities, mm. how we can live in a history very far away and yet uh, the same things or same techniques or very similar uh, patterns will emerge kind of at each place. Um, so we are uh, moving further to another speaker from this uh, center of uh, of art uh, production, uh, Zuzka Kolcunova, uh, who is, um, uh, she's, she works as a uh, consultant uh, uh, because uh, these institutions, uh, as it um, uh, centers the folk art producers, they also uh, offer uh, consultants for each of uh, the technique for uh, woodworking or for textiles or for any other uh, craft who are skilled in the tradition of that craft and can advise us how to proceed. Thanks, Zuzka. Okay. Thanks, Lubica. So I start the share screen. Okay. Can you see So can you see it? Can you hear me? Oh, no, I'm not okay. okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is uh, Zuzana Kolcunova. I'm, an, as, uh, I'm a consultant of Center for 
folk art production. Uh, I will tell you something about challenges in material sourcing for folk art, art for folk producers now and then. Uh, I would like to bring you an information about availability of wool as material across the time. I'll, I will focus on the period after Second World War up to present. I uh, will also talk about uh, pol uh, the political context. I think it's uh, very important for understanding what happened with the Slovak rule over time. So let's start. In uh, 1945, creation of Ulu. Uh, the institution according to law ensured the protection and promotion of craft and handmade production throughout the country and across all sectors. In law uh, and the newly established institution guaranteed activities that had previously been carried out in an unsystematic way. The beginning of Ulu's activity in the regions brought the institutionalization of production. It was represented by the formation of cooperatives. Some producers continued to work individually. In both cases, the Ulu influenced what should have been produced and also provide material and other support. Ever since its formation, designer or artists were an important part of the Ulu. Their mission was not only to cre create artistic designs, but also to supervise the artistic and technical level of the products. As for wool as a material, uh, in the previous period, uh, wool from sheep farming was processed in a domestic artisanal way. Since the 18th century, the processing of textile raw materials in manufactories has also become widespread. The sheep owners sold the produced wool to the clothiers who made it into the woolen cloth. They were uh, produced, uh, for example, wood cloth and then clothing and footwear from it, hats, knitted garments, accessories, guba also as a rat cassette, you already know. Uh, and I think we will have, uh, I will have the similar pictures <laughs> because we are working in the same organization. So <laughs> maybe you will see it uh, second time. So as Radka said, the guba is something like shaggy wool cloth or like woven wool fabric with long hair in the surface. And uh, also carpets was, uh, were produced. Okay, let's go next. Uh, now, we, now we have uh, year 1948 and the rise of the communist regime. Uh, after this year, domestic production was uh, curtailed by new state economic strategies, such as the creation of the United Farmers Cooperatives, also start uh, nationalization of livestock farming and the transfer of products, including wool, to the to state buyout. buyout sorry. Uh, this contributed, for example, to a deterioration in access to materials by individual producers. Sheep farming has been formally and practically moved away from producers who have lost direct contact with uh, the breeding and wool processing for the purposes of textile production. The result, the result was more difficult access to material. The state, uh, the state uh, redistributed the material wool to the very, various sectors. For wool and its producers were these amounts inadequate and at the same time, it didn't meet the quality requirements. The production of wool gradually disappeared accompanied with the decline of the folk clothing. The, post, uh, the postponement uh, of folk costumes began during the 19th century and culminated in the first half of the 20th century. Urban culture began to, began, began to uh, significantly penetrate the countryside. The decline in production was also linked uh, to the retreat of sheep farming, uh, also gradual transition to machine processing, and finally, the preference for factory-produced textiles 
which were cheaper and freed from the time, material and psychically demanding production process. I mean, there was no need to continue the production of traditional clothing components and textiles. Uh, more blankets, uh, carpets, knitwear and slippers began to be produced. Uh, in the 1950s, intensive housing construction took place all across the country. Based on this, there, was, there were assumptions that interest in home accessories of uh, folk art production would increase. In the case of woolen products, it was mainly about metrash, bubas, woolen carpets, etc. Already at the end of the 50s, the production of bubas began to resume. In the context uh, of wool production, the often mentioned problem was access to high quality wool. A problem appeared immediately after the end of the Second World War after persist, uh, and persisted in uh, various forms during the whole period of real socialism. Wool from the long-haired Valashka sheep was used in traditional folk culture and subsequently also in production organized in Ulv. The wool was uh, of various, various quality divided into two basic groups. Uh, the long one, which was thicker, and the shorter one, uh, one which was softer. The second was uh, considered to be of higher quality and was used in the clothing industry, including that organized in the Ulf. The problem in communist uh, regime was the poor supply of, the, of this wool to small producers and at the same time, the worse quality of the material. Often only second to third class uh, quality wool reached the handmade producers. This also led to the transition of factory produced wool and yarn usage. Wool also tried to help uh, tried to help secure wool for producers, but even this effort didn't bring enough success. It happened uh, that was able to deliver only chemically treated wool to many manufacturers and or producers and factories. In the 80s of the 20th century, Hemlon Gubas also appeared uh, as part of domestic production. Hemlon is like a kind of synthetic fiber. Uh, this non-professional produ production was pulled from, uh, the, from the fashion of Gubas. The factory production of the material used, Hemlon, provided wide var variability in the creation of patterns and colors. Compared to wool and gubas, synthetic gubas were easier, easier to maintain, but they were more dust prone and uh, generated uh, static electricity. Uh, the fashion of hemlong guba also points to the place of uh, wool and gubas in the market. Wood uh, handmade gubas were of better quality, but also the price was higher. The market provided a uh, more uh, accessible alternative in the form of hemlong bubas. After uh, 1989, the price of wool began to decrease. Uh, it means uh, better availability. How it, uh, however, it didn't prevent the decline of guba production. Uh, now uh, we, we will continue with uh, year 1989, uh, the fall of the communist regime. The year 1989 means uh, fundamental change in organization at, uh, and administration of Ulf as well as for the entire society. Production, distribution, sales, and labor relatives uh, between the institution and producers and factories had to adapt to the free market conditions. Establishment of license was, was preferred. This also means the loss of employment benefit for producers. It caused a gradual decline in the number of uh, collabor collaborators. Uh, with the beginning of the free market and the arrival of new materials, wool production gradually declined and the price of wool fell rapidly. Wool was uh, bought back 
in qualities that only some Slovak breeders could achieve. Uh, wool producer uh, in smaller, smaller quantities was sold below cost. Domestic breeders didn't know what to do with the wool and were willing to give it for free to those who know how to use it uh, for bubars, for example. Uh, later, if uh, breeders could not find a market for the wool, they were often forced, it, uh, forced to burn it or uh, pour it into the ground. Another problem uh, that is uh, the institution and those, the producers had to deal with in the new conditions was the increase in competition. Uh, to the present day, Ulu is a cultural institution which mission, mission is to carry out and support activities leading to the preservation and development of traditional crafts, folk art production, and to deliver them back into, to the public. Uh, Ulu also manages regional craft centers, uh, executes museum documentation, exhibition, and publishing activities. By cooperating with uh, producers and designers, it, it's uh, constantly stimulated uh, the creation of new works of arts. Ulu is not anymore a direct organizer for production of, of production, but uh, continues to cooperate with producers, uh, provides art consultancy and uh, helps mediate the sale of their products in the network of Ulu stories. Wool as material uh, in present, uh, the producers provide the material they, themselves and the consultant provides advice on the possibilities of suit, suitable material. Until recently, several producers who had uh, stock of material from older times uh, also cooperated with Ulu. The last stock is mostly from factories that have already closed their operation or switched to another one. Current producers uh, use wool from a variety of available sources, for example, some reach for uh, the wool available in the regular shop, which uh, unfortunately is often, uh, is often acrylic yarn or at the best time, uh, at the best uh, mix mixture. Uh, others buy sheep for uh, wool and uh, yarn from, from uh, foraging suppliers uh, from websites. In recent years, thanks to several enthusiasts, uh, the processing of uh, Slovak wool has uh, experienced, uh, experienced a comeback. So today it is possible to buy wool and yarn from Slovak sheep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> from uh, Slova Slovak sheep again. Uh, that's why even I, as, as a consultant, uh, recommended our producers to use mainly local resources I provide them with a direct context with uh, where sheep wool can be obtained. I'm glad that uh, these positive changes in recent uh, years contribute to the fact that uh, this precious material uh, uh, ceases to have the status of waste. Also, thanks to the civil association Nasha Vlna, uh, Mokosha <laughs> Vlnarska Manufaktura and other wool uh, processors uh, and enthousi enthusiasts. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Susanna. And uh, we uh, have now have three presentations and we will go on to uh, discussion uh, and I realized that we uh, have not uh, mm -hmm. a similar presentation about the history of Norwegian wool. Uh, it is quite uh, different uh, because um, all the time we have had uh, spinners uh, in Norway and also uh, weavery, uh, but uh, spinners are the most important and we have a quite good collection system. So um, different from many other countries, we have uh, had a continuously uh, production and many of the spinners are uh, at the same place. They have been with, for a very long time and also family owned. Um, so we have had this and actually the national costume 
and the willingness to pay for material for the national costume has been one of the backbone in the economy uh, for the sustain, sustain, to sustain this industry. And the other thing is the knitting. Uh, Norwegians are uh, knitting more uh, than many other countries. I don't know about uh, much about uh, Slovakia, but we knit <laughs> like twice as much as our neighbors and other countries we have uh, information about. So the knitting and the national costume has been very important for the uh, to uphold the uh, textile industry in Norway um, and also uh, a system for collecting wool. Uh, that makes the farmer uh, make it easier for the farmer um, to know where they can deliver it. Yes, uh, I have noticed a comment uh, in the in the chat on my um, on my um, comment about Spain and Portugal, and the comment says that Spain, as Portugal, has been independent, um, and I think yes. Uh, uh, I, it's not. It's a lot of. I don't know about Portugal history, but I think that that makes it even more important that when we talk about uh, Merino wool, it isn't only Spain. It is actual Spain and Portugal, because uh, the production of Merino wool was in both countries. So thank you for the comment. Um, and now you can choose. You can choose to uh, um, raise your hand. Uh, then you can talk if they can see you, and or you can also ask uh, through the chat. Um, and you can choose to talk uh, one of these three languages that we has we have used uh, so far. And I think a lot of us now has learned one Slovakian word, and that is sukno. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was uh, was a good one. Uh, it is like our bab babmel. And I think next time we meet, we should have a look whether these two fabrics actually are the same or if the, it is differences between them. Yes, uh, do we have anyone that wants to ask something from the speakers? Mm -hmm. I, maybe I have to see change my view so I will see if I can see any raised hands. Mm. Um, maybe I can... Uh... Uh, can I say something? <laughs> of before course. We, uh, yeah, before we... Yes, I can see two uh, questions. Uh, and the w one is about this with the Sukno and whether it is more like Luden. And uh, uh, that is then another name uh, again. Uh, so I, I guess that uh, Luden is is uh, like in Austria and uh, and Germany. Um, and um, but whether it is differences between the material in Luden, Wadmel, and Sukno, I don't know. So I think we need the, the, another expert to to talk about that. Maybe Karianne knows. I just know that there's such a lot I don't know about wool qualities, but there is a difference between um, what we call fulling in English, also toving, when you you know you work the wool so that it becomes felted in it, it with each other, then it gets strong. But the difference about how you finish it and some materials like um, I think also like Loden has a, um, the way they treat the surface and uh, some are cut and how they have been made and dyed and all this all through the ages and historically uh, there's so much I don't know and mm -hmm. I don't it's difficult to find um, sources for it or at least I haven't found that much. Hmm. Okay, then we have something to, to do later. But we have another question. I think that is also uh, suited for you, uh, Tariana. And that is, I wonder how the embroidery yarn thread was dyed to achieve such fascinating colors. Um, I didn't mention that in my talk, but uh, there is a, a change in how they dye 
in in um, textile dyes around 1850. In 1856, William Perkin, an 18 year old um, chemist in England, chemistry student, he discovered that there was um, uh, some. They were trying to make uh, something else, and uh, there were some uh, brown sort of crystals or fallout in a liquid and he tried boiling that in water and he found it was a very bright red color that's how that's when they started trying to make things from chara, chara, tar tar and um, so that was the beginning of the chemical aniline dyes they came after 1860 and 70 and uh, the english Englishmen didn't exactly understand how to make money of it because in the 1850s, nobody thought a chemist could earn money. I'm just saying. And um, But the Germans understood the point and uh, that uh, the chemical colors, the aniline colors and so on, have been the basis for a lot of uh, the um, pharmaceutical industries, the large pharmaceutical giants in the world. Before 1850, all dyes were natural dyes. And there was an enormous um, industry and in and uh, trade in dye stuffs. Most of the uh, spice trade with, uh, with the East was actually dye stuffs. The processes, uh, wool was actually the best textile to take dyes and to have uh, dyes, uh, it's very difficult to, it was very difficult to dye cotton before you got the chemical dyes. And also silk doesn't hold the color that much. So wool was the embroidery yarn that you could dye and have a good color, color in. But um, um, with natural dyes, the most important element is actually how the quality of the water where you live because the water is uh, some uh, if when people are doing the plump the fighting the natural dyeing with with the natural color yeah the colors um very often you can see that they just get different variations of beige or something but then the same processes in other place can get very nice bright colors. So it's got to do with the colors and the process and the dye stuffs and so on. There is a very good book called A Perfect Red written by an historian who um, shows how um, getting hold of the cochineal, the, the uh, the the lice from the cactus plant in, in um, Mexico was more valuable than gold in the 1600s. And uh, how getting the red color has been one of the main focuses and the main signs of being royal is the red color because it was so difficult to get, et cetera, et cetera. So there are lots of uh, color history. I'm sorry, but that's just a part of an answer mm. thank you and um, Ing will writes that she will talk a bit more about the history of Norwegian wool in one of the papers uh, after lunch and uh, after the lunch break and that is good uh, we will uh, hear more about uh, wool and less about uh, national costumes and bunad uh, in uh, in after uh, after the break uh, and then I think also Tone, you wanted to answer something, wouldn't or didn't I understand? No, then I, I was going to point to the uh, questions in in the Q and A, but uh, at that exact moment, uh, my phone rang from my okay, uh, okay, so. So that was the, that was the one. But I don't think it is more question in the Q and A. Um, is it someone that has tried to ask something that uh, we didn't uh, notice? Uh, you can uh, unmute yourself uh, and try to speak now. Uh, I can't see any hands up. 
Well, maybe I can say in, in Slovak. For yes, do, Slovak do so, moment. because it should be possible to unmute yourself and speak uh, if it's something you want to say. If you want to ask a question, you can write it in the chat, or below on the list you can see a little tak môžete sa akoby prihlásiť ako v škole, alebo, alebo uh, preste si zapnúť uh, mikrofón a, a kúsiť sa opýtať, ak chcete. Uh, did we, by the way, uh, Lizbeth, did you unmute uh, the, the audiences? We can unmute them when they raise their hands one by one, it seems. So okay. if they want to say something, it's good if they raise their hands and then I will unmute. Okay, okay. Yeah. Takže za, za, keď sa chcete prihlásiť na otázku, tak zlačte tam tú ručičku uh, a zapneme vám mikrofón a môžete, môžete potom hovoriť. Uh, I can use my, uh, that I speak. And uh, I wanted to ask very similar things to um, to what Karian uh, was now uh, talking about uh, for the girls from Ulu, Zuska and Radka. Do we have any uh, idea about what dyes uh, did we use in Slovakia before the chemical dye? Was it all like homemade and home dyes and uh, homespun? Yeah, it's a pretty similar, like in Norway, before the discovering the aniline, it was only natural dyes, and uh, maybe there is a difference between the homemade dyeing and the crafts and craftsmen dyeing in uh, cities. Mm -hmm. They can uh, use. They could use the dyes from the from the east also like in the norway like because the yeah the the so you you were able to buy uh, dye stuff yes yes like okay. it was uh, it was possible because and also it was uh, it was a little bit uh, influenced by the uh, for example, in Slovakia, in long period, they were uh, Turkish here, Turkish oh, wow. people, so they have uh, day dyes and they colored, so there mm. was uh, changing between them and us. Mm. Uh, do you, do you know what what color uh, they brought or what what color stayed here that wasn't here before? Um, not exactly. No. I, I, there's, there's a red. very <laughs> there's a very uh, important color called Turkish red or Turkish. Turkish red, yes. So, but also there were uh, in when it comes to dyes, not just embroidery yarn, but on textiles. We have had uh, an epiphany uh, three three years ago because I've been wondering for forty years how we have some very bright. You saw the bright red jackets, and how yeah. are they made? They look homemade, but they have this weird stripe down here, which looks like it's tie dyed. And I was thinking, yeah, what was this? Is it made at home uh, in Oz in Norway or whatever? And three years ago, I met a professor in textiles, at an English professor called Tim Perry Williams. And he said, I come from a place in England called Stroud. And Stroud was a center of red dyes, red wool dye for the whole world. They dyed, they uh, treated the wool and they dyed it and prepared wool and exported to the whole world. They're very popular among uh, American Indians, um, Telemark people in Norway, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, Royal Guard in China, and all the red coats, the uniforms of the soldiers, English soldiers, is all that was exported from this area. And then when the aniline dyes came, 
everything died out. So this is fascinating to see how uh, in Norway we've had this um, idea that everything is so homemade and we've done everything ourselves and all that <laughs> sort of stuff. And then we discover that hmm, we were international in the 16 and 1700s. You know, there was a lot mm. of trade going on and so on. And it's yeah. so fun. So I hope there will be possibilities of doing more research on that. Tim Parry Williams is doing it and he is fantastic. Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's a professor at the Kiyo at the Art uh, University in Bergen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, see in the, in the Q&A that I have a question uh, and that is about knitting. Uh, the question uh, is from Lucia. Uh, maybe I didn't pronounce it right. Uh, you sorry pronounce for that. It well. yes. Okay, thank That's you. Um, the question is why so much knitting in Scandinavia? And um, actually, it's not really the truth, maybe, that it is so much knitting in Scandinavia. The thing is that Norway has a lot of knitting, uh, and uh, so my answer is uh, is that why so much knitting in Norway, and also why so much knitting in wool in Norway? Because if you look at other countries, uh, the knitting has been also more in acrylic uh, than in wool, and also today we have a difference uh, between the wool market in Norway and other countries because it's so much. Um, knitting yarn in wool and also so little uh, synthetics uh, knitting also among uh, people uh, that um, that normally uh, not, not necessarily use uh, only wool or not necessarily has a lot of money so the the the, the market mm. is quite different but uh, to explain this is actually a long talk and uh, Tuna and I have talked about it many times and we also written a thick book about Norwegian knitting history and um, we think um, that uh, some of the uh, answer to the question is actually some of the same thing that Karianne talked about. Uh, it is linked to the construction of Norwegianness, uh, and that is based on um, our uh, textile traditions, uh, like uh, the bunad and the knitted garment as part of the bunad, but later also. Um, as part of something we call friluftsliv, which is actually to be outside and celebrate the nature and being in the nature. And this became Norwegian uh, also uh, because we had great explorer finding their way to the North Pole and the South Pole and this and that. Um, I think that Nansen is quite famous, at least he's very famous in Russia. So you might have heard about him. Um, and uh, he constructed um, clothing for um, being outside uh, and using uh, also a more practical kind of clothing based on uh, native people, but also on traditions. So in Norway, we think that some of this um, more knitting in Norway than in our neighbor countries is actually linked to this history of how to make a uh, a country Norwegian again uh, and uh, still we are using more knitted sweaters for all our great you know athletes uh, like the world championship and uh, and things like that we will be a new sweater and also uh, we have been blessed I would say with very uh, famous and very important uh, knitting designers uh, and also then this history with with the wool um, um, with with the um, uh, spinneries that has been kept, uh, and they have also supported Norway both with yarn but also with new designs all the time. So it's like a mixture of many different things that actually has led to the situation where Norway are knitting much more uh, than other countries. We think, I mean, we haven't uh, numbers on on this with knitting, and that is interesting in itself. Uh, but the, the the countries we have looked upon that we have found something about how many people actually are knitting, um, that is then um, twice as much in Norway, um, and that's quite you know that's quite a, a difference, and uh, and also uh, as Karianne told about with this with coming together, doing together, 
giving gifts, making a new baby in the family, giving, you know, knitted garments to the parents and so on and so on. So it's also linked to to to, um, to gift economy and uh, also to the way we are dressing, especially when we want to feel uh, a bit more Norwegian than in uh, every, every life, like I have done uh, today. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I guess that um, the Norwegian presence here will, in a way, all of us uh, have a part of this history. Uh, Tuna is dressed with, with the underwear uh, in, uh, from a Norwegian brand, uh, using a very famous knitting, uh, hand knitting uh, pattern. Uh, in a modern uh, design of merino wool underwear, so it's 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 like everywhere. It's not only in in hand knitting. It's also, yeah, and also tourists coming to Norway will buy um, what is called uh, in English Norwegian sweaters. So it's it is famous also other places, our knitting history. But it is also then quite um, astonishing that we with so much uh, textile history and also knitting history, don't really have a great knitting history museum. We have an exhibition at the Folk Museum where Kajane is working, <laughs> but the, the, that is quite uh, modest, I would say, this uh, exhibition. <laughs> we have but... to fight to get it. I have to say that when I started as the curator of textiles and clothing at the museum, I started looking at how many sweaters do we have like the one you have on and we had very few because that was sort of so every day it wasn't something to collect and uh, if you see school photos from the 60s all the children in a, a school class 10 15 year olds have the knitted sweaters and it's just part of the whole thing yeah. but one fun fact is that Norway was one of the countries that started knitting at latest in Europe. We were very slow to get started knitting, but then we still we're still doing it in a way. Hmm. Yeah, but I also think now that it is some question in Slovakian, uh mm -hmm. in, in the QA. So uh, so maybe Lubika could uh, translate them for us. Um I I think the question was already answered. It was about um it was about how guba is made. And the girls already spoke about that. It was uh, guba was a uh, the, the carpet or the, the big shabby coat uh, as uh, girls talked about. And it was a woven uh, fabric with a thick wool and uh, uh, the three strands of the outer coat of the long strands of wool were woven into it. So they were like, hanging outside. But we have a, um, we have a raised hand among the attendants. So maybe Lisbeth can can you unmute them to let them ask the question and I have a I have a question. It, I think that hand disappeared, but if anybody wanted to oh, talk from oh, the audience, okay. please put your oh there it's back okay. up. Now I can find okay. the person. I yeah, will I allow you to talk now. There yeah. you go. So Lenka you can you can talk. You can unmute yourself and talk, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, please? Yes. Okay. So uh, I have a question, not directly to the wool, but other materials which are connected to traditional fall costume. Um, because spinning, you have mentioned, uh, was not so wide in Slovakia because spinning was more connected with linen and hemp probably and it was it was there was also yeah, yeah. Wool, but less. so my question is in in your country uh is part of history also such kind of material as the linen or, or hemp you have mentioned a cotton body in in costume but what about linen and hemp was it in your country in the past as well Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we have had also uh, plant materials production in Norway, uh, not cotton, of course, uh, but linen uh, and also uh, other plants uh, like nettle. Um, 
and uh, the thing is uh, again that I I'm not a specialist on uh, on this, and uh, it is has also been imported uh, fibers uh, to Norway. Uh, when it comes to more recent years, uh, the production of linen has been uh, uh, bigger, for instance, in Sweden, and also better kept. Uh, but today it is um, a, a new interest uh, in linen in Norway, and also nettle. Uh, when it comes to ham, uh, we actually has, uh, it's not allowed uh, in Norway, and that's quite strange because, you know, it is another, another plant than the one that uh, someone likes to smoke. So it's, it is like a strange thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, the production has been um, um, uh, not very big. Uh, so uh, in Norwegian history, wool has been the most important um, material, uh, but also linen. And of course, linen for all the for the for, for the linen. Uh, uh, and we still actually have linen weavery in in Norway. So we do also have production on on, on woven uh, linen. Uh, but we don't have um, um, a big production of uh, linen commercially. We have some private production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and then we have, uh, yeah. And what was the most common material for women's skirts, so the, those beautiful long women's skirts? skirts? Yeah, the skirts is wool. Uh, okay. Yes, the skirts is wool. Uh, sometimes the aprons uh, could be cotton, you know, when cotton came, uh, and silk scarf. Uh, so it has been both imported material and uh, homemade material. Um, so it, it's it, in in the historical part here. But of course, Karjana knows the history better than me. So maybe you could add on. But I think it is uh, fair to say that both um, home production and some luxury goods has been imported. And then this changed when cotton came because cotton, I mean, in the beginning, of course, it was a luxury and we have beautiful um, uh, early uh, cotton in some of the fall costumes, but cotton became uh, cheaper and actually then change from wool and linen to cotton uh, was a price uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, not in the beginning, I mean, because then it was luxury, but but, uh, but later. Um, so cotton is like uh, the beginning of what we uh, face today, that clothes are of very little value and that it is cheap to import things. So then this history starts with cotton and with, with the, you know, sad history of slavery and, and, and colonies and all these things that we are struggling with, with finding our way out of today. But maybe, yeah. I don't know if Karyana would add something on this with the material in historically. You are muted. You have to unmute yourself. I have to be nice so no bad noises came from me. <laughs> um, when uh, it comes to skirts, uh, in the region, I've, I've, I've been working very much uh, from one region, so I'm kind of nerdy there. but. Uh, as as late as the 1950s, 60s, 70s, there were women uh, wearing traditional folk dress, the last type called stock olive in that area. Um, and uh, a woman uh, inter interviewed 15 women who had worn only a traditional dress all their lives in 1980. And uh, they told her that, yeah, we wove our, we wove the material for the skirts ourselves, and we wove it from white wool, and then we sent it off to get it uh, dyed uh, to people who were doing the dyeing. And we could also, in some periods, the fashion was that it was pleated, that it could send it and get it pleated. So uh, that and that was the middle of the twentieth century. So it's not that long, long ago. Mm -hmm. But what we can see in the folk dress from the early ones from um, 1800 and up towards 1900 is that there is a change 
some of the old folk dress, which might be very special wedding dress and so on, could be imported broadcloth from England or something very good quality that people imported themselves. And, or it could be home woven. So you had all variations. And then after 1860, 70, 80, you start seeing more and more um, um, bought materials, very professional uh, wool, satin materials, and that sort of thing that is uh, much more uh, part of a money economy instead of a natural uh, home economy or whatever you would call it. I don't know if that answers your question. Bonnie. Yes, thank you both for a nice explanation. That's that's good. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, again and again we see this uh, this how how uh, the our traditions are both based on uh, the material we do have and uh, homemade and also today we can see this this um, connection between. Um, textiles as uh, handcraft and uh, something that we are doing, many of us are doing today while listening, uh, and the industry. Uh, and mm -hmm. what uh, Karina also talked about is with sending away to have it dyed, sending it away to have it pleated or felted, um, or uh, also sending away the wool to have it carded and then spun uh, at home uh, later. All this uh, connection between home production and the wool industry has been very close. And I think it still is close. Uh, it's closed uh, It's closed because uh, many of the hand knitters in Norway will know, um, know the spinnery or visit the spinnery or uh, use, you know, uh, contribute with with patterns uh, also not professional designers so it's like this connection is quite um, uh, quite uh, tight between uh, between the, um, the 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 production and the uh, home production consumption of wool and i think that is also an interesting thing that we can take with us for the discussion after lunch uh, because then we talk more about the production today and the struggle uh, to find a, a good connection between uh, the sheep, the wool, the production and the consumers. Uh, so uh, we have a history with so much, you know, um, connections between production and consumption of wool. Uh, that is an interesting thing. But yeah, uh, now yeah. Lubeka wants to say something, yeah. so I should uh, yeah. keep quiet. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's connected exactly to uh, what you are saying now because as I was um, listening to uh, Karian and you now answering the questions, uh, it seems to me that this is like to the meat of this topic and to the meat of uh, what we want to talk about and like to um, deconstruct what is it about Norway that uh, let you keep the continuity and what happened in Slovakia that um, that made it not continue. And uh, it was very interesting, the, the notes about the, if I may call it so, like the Bunat movement and uh, uh, the lady that promoted uh, the Norwegian style and the traditional folk costume and it spread across the country and it became this sign of national identity that uh, we are proud of and therefore we wear it. And um, uh, it seems to me that uh, though from a very different perspective, uh, communism a little bit did the same because it wanted to uh, close the borders and uh, uh, let the people uh, just use their own culture and it was preferred like the home culture, home music, home textiles, home production, home industry, everything was preferred to be local. So that was, if it's possible to say it was a positive thing of communism because it wasn't very well made or realized uh, but then uh, in the 89 
in the year 89 when uh, the revolution came and communism fell. And this will be a, a discussion uh, or question for for girls in Ulu. If you if you have something to say to that, uh, it's a theory of mine, it's just idea that maybe um, as as this kind of national pride was very uh, narrowly bound to the regime, mm. maybe that's why after the revolution, when we entered the capitalism, which we are still not very good at, uh, we kind of left the national pride behind us, you know, mm. as, and this concept never made it to the contemporary time. And therefore, after those, what is it now, 40 years, 35 years, uh, we are kind of revisiting and rediscovering the national craft as our own, our local, our pride, our whatever. And uh, this is kind of what we are and or, or uh, I think we might be a bit thick ass or stupid ass uh, that we have to reach the the level where it's the, the thing is almost lost, and then we catch on to it and try to revive it. And of course, uh, then much more work has to be done to bring it back than if we kept the continuity still. Mm -hmm. So if we are looking for some, you know, like emotional background or the motivation to keep the continuity going this would be probably it and this might be a reason why there is a gap and it took away uh with it all the uh, like industry and local produce and crafts and uh, uh, evaluating the crafters as well because now it's all business I have a point there, if if it's possible. Yeah. Um, when we talk about uh, Norwegian being proud of being Norwegian, of a national identity, one thing is that is very important is that uh, I've uh, lived a lot of my life. I'm born in India and so on. I I came to Norway as a sort of very confused teenager and. I'm tr I've been trying my whole life to understand how Norwegians got that way. But when I tried to find a definition of what does it mean to be Norwegian, I, uh, I constantly end up with a Norwegian is a person who comes from someplace. You have a local identity. And that is part of what is very important with the Bunads. Also with the sweaters, because they're local sweaters. And maybe they're just constructed local, but it's a name and so on. Uh, uh, what sort of food you eat for Christmas evening? Christmas Eve is depends on uh, if there's a tradition with fish or meat or whatever. It's uh, everything is very local, and uh, that makes the bunats and th that sort of sim symbolism very important. I think that's part of what makes us uh, use so much time and effort. And some people, I'm sorry to say, use a lot of money on this stuff. And another thing that these women who wove their own materials and so on and died, got it dyed and so on, the observation of the woman who was interviewing them was that they knew so much about the quality. Of, they were so good at uh, deciding the uh being weighing the quality and finding out the quality of the wool or the materials they wanted to make their their folk dress from and that is one of the things that is vanishing now in norway people don't know the difference between synthetic and wool and so on and so forth and that is a place where we need to work more I also have a comment to you, Lubeka, and I think your your comment here is very, very good. And I think it is something with nationalism 
which is both very scary and, and can be very destructive and uh, also uh, very beautiful and, uh, and, and good. Uh, and that makes everything, and just to speak about it is like a bit scary because uh, you don't want to say a lot of nice thing about the regime that you were happy getting rid of, or, you know, it's it's like, it is it is difficult. Uh, and also today we can see how, how this with protection uh, of the local, um, the local production which we are, you know, uh, working with uh, are, uh, both very important, sustainability is important, it's identity uh, important, but it's also part of um, forces that we don't want to be a part of at all. So it's like uh, um, um, on on a quite narrow balance. road we are walking. Balance. And then, of course, uh, your comment about your history uh, with, uh, with uh, being part of another economical system uh, is so much more dramatical than ours, which we uh, slowly, slowly became more and more part of uh, another kind of of, of uh, capitalism, where the home production went like down, and the market forces uh, become more and more important. So, I mean, our history is is uh, um, interesting to compare especially because uh, you are a part of this uh, post-soviet or post-communism uh, which is now so important in in in, uh, in europe so yeah um but uh, we have uh, now also other questions uh, in the q a i think um um no i'm constantly going on the in the wrong direction when I'm looking but, at but, it but but Ingen I, I could also um, the Ulu a comment on, on yes um, of course because it actually was a question yeah, for you yeah. as well uh, and you haven't uh, Susanna have you any comment to this no Do you have I don't know one of you yeah, you can do it later also. I may, I guess we'll come back to this discussion. I can, maybe yeah. Zuska will be better, but I can also. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, definitely I agree with uh, Lubica. Um, and also the, the, the folk costumes, as we know them now, they were formed in 18th and 19th century, which is a little bit late. And it was because the our territory was a part of the Austria Hungary monarchy. Yeah. So it was the short period when people wore them. Because in the beginning of the 20th century they slowly stopped wearing them. So mm -hmm. it's like only 100 uh, years which is not so long in the uh, of the history perspective. And uh, also communist regime uh, do it like one thing that the they, for example, in fall costumes, they change the, the, the how they look because uh, they were used for uh, celebrations like the communist holidays and they were in the time so many uh, dances group uh, developed and they use them like the stage costumes so they changed the visual of the costumes because for example some embroidery was in white color on wine plain fabric but if you want to use it on the stage, you have to make it visible. So they they make it uh, red or pink. Yeah. And uh, the bigger the bigger size or size. Yeah. So so it so was the costumes uh, that we know today are much more representative looking than than they used to be normally. They yeah, they, they are, they are more by... more decorative and maybe more colorful colorful than before. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think that the people now uh, they when they look at it they uh, they often connect it with this this particular celebrations or holidays like when they look at the stage and dancers were there so so mm. maybe this is why uh in Slovakia it's not that common that people wore them like in you in the Norway you said the it's uh bunet is wore on holidays etc etc in Slovakia sometimes in weddings after the midnight but that's that's it. Um, we wear it not... at the markets, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's On not the common that... the wool. <laughs> yeah. Um thank you. And uh I have looked at the chat again and it is um Ingvil has said that um, we do have a museum with a lot of knitting, and that's true. And that is in the middle of Norway, which is very close to where this, her, this, this uh, um, factory is. And I, I, but the thing is that this is a very little place, and it's a little, you know, it's a lot of a nice collection, but it isn't like open all the time, and it is like very private in a way. So it's not a national museum. It's it, it's more. Uh, but if you are coming to Norway, I hope we will you know following up this with with uh, more collaboration. And then of course we will uh, visit this museum. That would be great. And then we also have two questions that are more uh, uh, directed um, to how uh, the value chain in Norway is functioning um, about how. Uh, whether we are uh, um, uh, using our own wool and the connection between the industry and the hand spinners and uh, the knitters and the, 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 the wool and the factories, uh, the whole value chain uh, for wool in Norway today. And I think that's a very good question. But I think we should uh, discuss that after English presentation, after the lunch, because then you will hear more and then you can ask your question again and more precisely from what you haven't heard so far. Yes, um, so then I can't see any other questions, but maybe I missed something. Is it someone that yes, has- Yes, you, you, missed, you missed one thing. Um, and um, I picked it up and it was about the uh, Guba. Uh, and it was um, a question if this is some sort of tufted uh, fabric. Yeah, um, and there was an answer that um, that um, is unsure what tufted is, but yes, it is a woven fabric with a chunky weft, and the loose strands of wool are woven in, so they hang out loosely. Um, and yeah, I uh, yeah you answered it, uh, <laughs> which is good. Uh, but uh, the thing is, um, uh, when um, uh, when I was uh, looking at um, this technique or or, or or looking at also the, the the more modern versions of it with there was a vest or something um, that I think Ulf showed. Uh, but anyway, I, I it, it reminded me of the Botri uh, Tingun. Uh, Did you think of that? Uh, to, yeah, uh, about uh, the Botri or the that type of, yeah. of uh, technique. Yeah, but I'm not sure now if we are talking about the same or not. I mean, are we talking about the felted material or are we talking no. about this with 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 loose? With the floss. You know? With the floss. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the with loose. The yeah. With the loose. Because yeah. the thing yeah. is that uh, this with loose, uh, both wool, but also it can be um, um, rags, uh, you know, old materials. Uh, this is very known in our traditions, and it has been used both for making like an artificial fur. Uh, and this is very connected to sea because the sheep skin and other skins, they don't keep in salt water. They become stiff. So to have, you know, to go with open boats to, to, to America get... and the south of Europe, and I don't know where, like the Vikings, they had to have something with them that uh, kept them warm in the boats. And uh, so we do have this strong tradition for uh, woven material with 
uh, with loose material hanging. And in Norwegian, it's called båtrier, which is, it, um, yeah. yeah, boat um, rugs. Uh, uh, yes. And in in, um, in in Iceland, varafell. And we do have at a, a museum at the West Coast in Norway, where they have kept the woven traditions with with the you know the 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 weave warp, that is standing the where warp, you are warp weighted loom yes like uh, but uh, yeah. there's also a uh, new research going on now in southern norway which shows that the rier were also used inland not just on boats okay and I didn't there's, know. A, there's a new book coming out soon hmm, and it's, it's very exciting uh, about that and um and also uh, using, I asked Arne Emil Christensen once about this, the the um, sheepskin and, and things like that couldn't be used in boats. One thing is it got stiff. The other thing is that it gets moldy. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't dry out. So it's, um, and the boat, the boat rear were regarded as extremely valuable. Uh, they were nearly worth more than the boat in a way and it was really there was so much work making it and so on and so forth and and this but but also uh, this uh, technique has been done also to make uh, like uh, uh, patterns and and uh, and more you know of, on hats on knitted materials as well uh, so mm -hmm. it, we can also see that these kind of textiles has been used for more decorative uh, purposes as well as the more practical warm and um, material and uh, so we have both and we do have today a little uh, production at this museum at the west coast that are making copies uh, of um, Botri with or Varafell if you choose mm. uh, and, and it is uh, a very interesting uh, textile uh, um, and uh, warm and you can use all materials you can use unspun wool you can you know to, um, mix it together so this is an interesting uh, textile tradition you also have the floss as a decoration on uh, embroidered mittens and things you can have floss on the sides here which are stiffen it and make it as uh, an important part of the decoration which is actually the same technique in a way. I, I just went to, to fetch because I made the floss just now, uh, uh, um, like an uh, uh, outdoor dress, I will call it. But as you can see, I have made floss of of uh, woven materials on the edge. Like uh, uh, I wanted to see a picture uh, because uh, it doesn't find any boat bugs. <laughs> <laughs> It is the same, you know. You have uh, make loops of uh, of the the, the extra uh, so yarn. So it was of... woolen. It was woolen as well. This is yes. This this is wool, but uh, the traditionally, yellow... traditionally yeah, it was wool. silk yeah. and wool in my yeah. case. I can see if I can try to find a picture. Yes, uh -huh. do Karyana. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we now have finished with all the questions? Um, then we can have our break so. a bit before, or is it more? I can't. Uh, it's one in the chat, a new one in the chat. Is felting wool? No, there is another one. Where way. is another one? Yeah. Um, who is trying to say something okay. for us? If, if uh, the the question is if felting wool is also a tradition in Norway? Yes. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I was starting to look for the the floss. Um, uh, I it depends on what you mean by felting. I mean, uh, in English, it's called fulling when you, uh, you know, rub ta wool together to make it uh, stronger. And um, I don't know if you mean that with felting too because so um if i may uh, uh, uh pulling is just when you want to uh kind of fluff up the the yarn uh, or the um uh, woven cloth a bit but felting is uh 
non-woven, non-knitted. Yes, non right. That, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. because uh, I can't say that felting has been a thing in Norway, although we do have a museum factory where they do have a felting machine. So mm -hmm. uh, we do have it, but it's the it's the pulling, like the vodmel, the all the main clothing was production of vodmel in in homes, in, on farms and so on. And uh, there were rules about um, you you made the vodmel and was very very thick and very durable, and that was what you made clothes from. So it wasn't exactly comfortable, but it was, it could wear for, a, uh, it could be very hard wearing and, and last a long time. So mm -hmm. I, I can't say we've had much felting here, no. Yeah, Tuna is showing uh, a piece of, um, a piece of uh, this with the, um, we talked about. Will you yes. explain yes. it, Tuna? Yeah, this is, um. Uh, this is an experimentation that was done uh, as part of a project that uh, we had called um, Viking Gold. Uh, and um, we had the um, Norwegian design team that actually tried out this this method to to make a mm -hmm. like a that you could wear yeah. around your neck. Yeah. Uh, and um, um, it of course became very expensive to produce. So uh, they thought maybe they could they could sell it on the Japanese market uh, as with, you know very very exclusive Viking tradition from from Norway, but um, it didn't really work out. They also made you hear Alenka, that's the way to go. Yeah, <laughs> they also made this sort of like mitten type of thing that you can mm -hmm. see here yes. using the same technique. Yeah, yeah, oh, quite nice. Yes, um, then um, we have talked about materials uh, and uh, Lisbeth has put in the chat that you can uh, look for both Rir and you will find pictures of these woven materials in, uh, I in found Norway. Some. I found some, so I'll, I'll have it after the break. Okay. Oh. If anybody want, uh, if somebody can help me put it up or something. Yeah. Um. Then uh, you can send it to one of us, and we can do. Uh. Then we have a break, and uh, we planned break from twelve to one o'clock. Yeah. I think we should uh, keep with the time one because uh, it might be for people that comes uh later. Uh. So I think we will do that. Then we will have a good break to do other things and to eat and to have new coffee and so on. And then we start again at one o'clock as planned. And you can either uh, just let your computer uh, run uh, and uh, let the Zoom link uh, live there its own life, or you can go out and come in again. Both is is uh, fine. Um, okay. And yes, and that's uh, everything I think for now. So then I hope you will have a nice break, all of you. Okay, I will translate that firmly. Uh, takže dáváme si teraz uh, obědovou přestávku do jedné, o jedné se znova uh, všichni připojíme. Uh, a když doma nebo na počítači můžete nechat okno otevřené, len ta vypne mikrofon a kamera a uh, můžete si to iba zapnout potom, když uh, se znova připojíte, alebo ak potřebujete zavřít okno, tak se můžete připojit na svět přes ten istý link v maili i vlastovací. Dobre? Ok. Bye for now. See you at one. We'll continue. Yes, you heard that. Uh, the webinar is recorded. Um, so that will be good for the people that couldn't attend. Uh, and uh, that means that if someone don't want to show their face, they have to have the camera off all the time. Yeah, uh, before lunch, uh, we had three presentations uh, and uh, it was about both uh, full costume and bunad in Norway and Slovakia. And these three presentations talked about the materials in uh, the costumes 
and also a change of material in the costumes. Uh, now we will continue, but we will continue with more about the wool and more about the value chain in both countries. And it will be also both uh, more up to day. Uh, and the problems uh, of the value chain, I guess, will be very highlighted both um, from, from both prospect from both uh, countries. And after these three presentations, we will have time to discuss the three presentations. And we hope all of you would take part um, in um, the Q&A written in all, all three languages we can uh, use, Norwegian, Slovenian and English. Or you can also uh, raise your hand and we will try to find you and give you uh, the floor. Uh, and also there you can speak in one of these three languages and we will translate and find answers to the question. After that, we will have some time uh, to discuss uh, uh, for further possibilities for cooperation. And in this part, of course, some of you would not attend because you are not so interested in that and that's fine. Maybe we will be a smaller group, but all of you are most welcome to stay the whole um, uh, webinar. Yeah, I think now we are ready for more um, input. And actually also uh, in the first session, it was a lot of questions about what we will hear about now, the wool value chain in Norway. And uh, it is Ingvil Espelin that will present this for you. And she uh, is uh, the founder of a mini uh, mill first, at least, in Norway, called Selbuspinneri. Now it's bigger. I guess we will hear about that. And her background is not from textile, but for with interest for animals. So it was through her interest for one of our old breeds uh, that actually this all happened. But Ingvild and me and Tuna, we have worked together in many projects. Uh, in the volume project that we talked about a bit before lunch, uh, about Polish mountain sheep wool, uh, but also in a, project, a little project with Portuguese wool. And of course, in Norwegian projects, um, both today and earlier. So we have worked with wool together for a long time. And I must say that one of the things that I appreciate, I mean, she's a nice person, of course, but it's one thing I think is very important. And that is that a smaller factory that is more um that can turn easier and don't have this uh, huge production and um, and a very standardized production these smaller factories can be very very helpful in research and development and i think we will see more about that now because we need these small ones because they can you know be more hands on in in small batches in small uh, development projects. So this is actually not only a quality of a person, but it's also a quality of the size of different factories. So I will say that that we in Norway have both big and small um, wool mill um, spinners are important. Yes. So that was a long introduction, Ingvild, and I I um I hope all of you will have all these questions answered by your presentation. Okay, thank you. So then I will try to share the screen. Let's see if you can see. I think I use that one. Um, and if I can get this one in front now. Uh, and... Okay. Is this okay? Yes. I don't know why this is open. I'll try to do like that. Okay, so I'll try. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I will tell a little bit about our uh, spinning mill and a little bit about the work that we do and why we started the, the spinning mill. So let's see. Oh, suddenly I can't. Oh, hmm. there it came. So we are, uh, as Ingun said, we are a small spinning mill and uh, actually by uh, accident, we became a family business. 
I was the one that started it, but today uh, my three daughters are all working in the business and I will tell a little bit about what we do later. Of course, we have a great passion for wool and uh, we have the focus on the Norwegian sheep breeds, as you will see. So first, a little bit about the wool value chain. There was some questions about that earlier. And we have, are very fortunate in Norway because we have a national wool collecting system. Uh, it's very well established and has been going on for many, many years. And actually, uh, yesterday I had uh, a visitor who is the leader of the what we call the Fagetjensen for Ull, which is uh, the quality uh, um, organization for the wool uh, grading system in Norway. She she's the leader from that, and we had a very nice discussion about discussion about the wool grading in Norway. Uh, the farmer always uh, can always uh, deliver the wool to somewhere. That's the very big uh, point about the wool collecting system. So uh, not depending on the wool quality, uh, the farmer is able to deliver the wool. But the payment is very different for the different qualities of wool. The best, uh, the highest classes of the white wool is well paid, uh, I guess more than in most of Europe six euro per kilo for for the best wool uh, while the coarse pigmented wool is not paid for at all and i will talk a little bit more about that uh, the sheep that you can see on this picture is uh, one of the heritage breeds in norway it's called blesset so uh, we have a lot of uh, different heritage breeds in norway uh, i think there is a little more than 20 norwegian sheep breeds now and from these, 12 are recognized as vulnerable. Uh, fortunately, during the later years, the, the, the red list for the sheep uh, has declined. So now all these 12 sheep breeds, they are not listed as uh, uh, threatened, but only vulnerable. Uh, we have two main groups of sheep in Norway. We have the oldest sheep breeds which are double coated uh, uh oh sorry uh, there's a mistake here yeah, the double coated uh, sheep has a short tail uh, while the single coated the younger sheep breeds uh, are the long tailed I, I mixed that up in this slide sorry about that <laughs> Uh, the wool of these uh, heritage sheep breeds are mostly coarse, as I said, and uh, it's pigmented like the sheep you can see on this picture. It's uh, Grå Trøndersau, uh, and the colors of this uh, breed is from almost black to brownish or grayish, uh, like you see. And the, for this kind of wool, the farmer will get less paid or nothing at all, depending on the quality. Uh, these sheep are normally also a little bit smaller than the white sheep, so there's less meat, and this also makes the payment for the meat uh, lower for the farmers. Uh, I wanted to share a video with you. I can see. Yeah, here it is. It's only a minute, but please uh, enjoy. Now the farmer is calling for the sheep. So this farmer, he is called uh, Olav, and he lives only five minutes from uh, our uh, uh, spelling hill. And he's one of the farmers that we work together with. And you can see that the sheep, they, of course, they run to him because he has food. But also, if he didn't have food, they will still come because they love him. It's a very close connection between the farmer and the sheep. And uh, so that was just to remind you what you are really talking about here. <laughs> so I'm going to say a little bit more about the pigmented wool. Uh, here is uh, an example of uh, one of the short tailed uh, sheep with a double coated wool. And this is the old uh, Norwegian Spelsa, which is a rather old sheep. We don't know actually how old it is, uh, but uh, Sheep like 
this could have been around uh, during the Iron Age, probably around that. So uh, the reason why we started the spinning mill was that we saw that the econ economy of the heritage sheep breeds is very poor. Uh, the sheep are small, so less meat, and the wool is not paid for. So uh, we tried to do something about that. And if the farmers delivers the wool to us and makes yarn, he can get around uh, two to 3,000 kroner per kilo for the yarn, while the wool is actually not paid for. So it's a huge difference. But of course, it will also mean that he has to do a different kind of work with the wool that he didn't do before. So our main production is actually for the sheep farmers. So most of the yarn we make is going right back to the farm. But we also have a web shop and a factory outlet. Uh, and we try to, in everything we do, we try to focus on quality and make uh, long lasting products. Uh, we do a lot of work on the sorting. Uh, I have been attending quite a few courses in wool grading in the uh, wool uh, system in Norway. And we do uh, share this knowledge also with the farmers in, in courses. And uh, we sort the wool according to purpose. So there's no such thing as bad wool. There's just different uses for the wool. Uh, and this is one of our main focuses. And we have been doing wool uh, sorting courses in uh, a lot of places in Norway, but also in Portugal and Poland and uh, Estonia. So we love to go to other countries and discuss the, the grading of the wool. Uh, a little bit about the process. Um, we are a small spinning mill. Something between a mini, mini mill and a normal small spinning mill. Uh, and all the processes are quite uh, short and easy in our process uh, compared with a, an industrial spinner. But still, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, we start with the sorting or the grading, and then we have to wash the wool with our in our own washing system. Uh, we dry the wool. Uh, then we have to open it and it goes through carding, sometimes also through a fiber separator. And we do the stretching on a draw frame. And then we spin and our yarn is uh, semi-worsted, which, which means that we prefer to have quite long fibers. And the yarn will feel quite smooth and, uh, and soft compared with the um, carded yarn. <laughs> So there's a lot of work before the yarn is finished for sale. Uh, we can see that there is a lot of challenges uh, through this uh, value chain from the sheep to the finished product. And for us, it's very important that we think about quality and competence. So that's why we do courses and attend uh, work together with others in, in projects. Uh, and also we try to discuss with the farmers uh, all the details about how things are going, like the sheep's living conditions is actually very important for the finished uh, wool uh, product. So, and we also try to cooperate with others. I'll tell a little about that later. So we, we put things together in like local wool value change chains we cooperate with the with the farmers uh, and we try to use all wool so the dirty wool can go to a company quite close by which is called Vulero, who makes fertilizer there's a lot of these uh, small companies around in europe now i know and fortunately we have our own here uh, also, we cooperated with cooperate with a, a knitting uh, factory, a small knitting factory, uh, and also with the hand knitters. Uh, and this kind of network is what we call the fiber shed movement. So we are a member of the Norwegian fiber shed, and we were actually. Uh, partnered during the startup of the fiber shed in, shed in Norway and 
just this last week, I uh, became a member of the European Fibershed Board. So it's possible to contact me if you from Slovakia are interested in uh, working with the starting a fiber shed in Slovakia. This is an example of uh, the completing the value chain. Uh, this guy here, he's called Arnar and he works with his knitting machine, which he called uh, Magda. And Magda, she is a 3D knitter. Uh, and she can work day and night and make very, very nice sweaters from the wool uh, collected on, from local sheep. And we spin it in our spinning mill and uh, Magda is knitting it for Arnar. So the sweater he wears in this picture is actually knitted on the machine. And this kind of small scale uh, knitting is uh, obviously very popular now because uh, Arnar is sold out all the time so he is really struggling to to deliver enough uh, of his sweaters i think uh, i i thought about uh, this uh, cultural her heritage with a uh, bit of wool in norway uh, just when i wrote this uh, presentation and i had to look a little bit back in my own family and here you can see pictures of uh, the kind of buna that we have in my family. It's actually uh, several different uh, examples here. And uh, the, the young skinny girl at the picture is me, nine years old in 1972. Very happy with my uh, small uh, girl bunad. Uh, that's actually not a real bunad. It's a kind of folk costume from the farm where my family came from. And on this picture, I can see that I, I guess I struggled to get it on because it's starting to be a little bit too small for me. So uh, I guess it was the last time I wore it and uh, some other girls in my family could have it. Just now it's in another part of the family. It's walking around. Uh, and when I wore it, it was uh, around uh, 70 years old. Today it's still living and it's more than 100 years old. And uh, the, the other pictures are from different uh, embroideries that I found on my bunads. Uh, one is uh, quite new. It's from, I think, 2010, probably. Uh, but uh, the one on the on the, the other side of the of the picture here is from a doll's uh, bunad. I don't know. Can you see me now? I don't know if you can see if I put things up because I can't see you. Uh, but this is the same bunad. It's for a small doll and it's more than 100 years old. So I have my own private museum with this bunad stuff. Uh, I guess the textile in the, in the bunad could be uh, bought from some industry, but I don't know. But I think it's quite interesting to try to look into the details of this and, and work with it further on. Uh, we haven't been reconstructing anything for bunads because we don't spin very thin yarn, but we have been working on the reconstruction on other uh, projects. So this is the Lendebre tunic, which was found in the, a glacier. Uh, sometimes we can thank the climate change for uh, news coming up, and this is an example of that. So in this project, we reconstructed the yarn for uh, for the new Landebre tunic, which is so shown here at the picture. We also do did a drop spindle test, but the yarn in the in the new tunic is not spun on drop spindle spindle because we didn't have time for that. But it was very exciting to to work on the reconstruction and make a yarn that should look like it was spun on a drop spindle. Uh, we could not have done this reconstruction if it was not for the old sheep breed. Here is the oldest of the Norwegian sheep breeds. It's called the Old Norse sheep. And its pet name is the wild sheep, but it's actually not wild at all. It's uh, It's a very nice little sheep. Uh, and to do the reconstruction, it's uh, essential that we have these old sheep breeds. If we miss them, we can't spin a yarn from their wool. 
so this is uh, on the core of the problems of the textile traditions made from wool. So, and we also, of course, uh, need to do the products local, like they once were, uh, to make the proper material and adjust for the local uh, wishes and uh, cultural uh, traditions. And all this is a part of the Norwegian immaterial cultural heritage. And it all depends on the competence of the producers. So this is, uh, for me, very important things. This is another example. Uh, Anna Borsgård is uh, actually living quite close to us, but she is also uh, a woman from Selbu. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that we have a knitting museum in Selbu. Uh, it's, it's almost like a secret because it's not very open to public. You need to ask to get into it. Uh, but they still have uh, a lot of these old mittens back to 1857. And Anna had has had a project for many years when she, where she reconstructed these uh, old mittens with these very, very nice patterns. Uh, we made the yarn. Uh, the yarn is a reconstruction of the old yarn in the old mittens. And then Anna made a big exhibition of the mittens and she also wrote... Uh, book about these mittens and it actually became a bestseller in Norway and this book is now translated into several languages including Japanese and English so and in Japan they are actually all wild about these uh, old patterns I think it's a very nice story you can see on this picture that the different uh, natural colors of the sheep are used so the, the black yarn is made from the blaze itself and the gray yarn is made from the the white one yarn is from different white uh, heritage breed, sheep breeds. And as Tuna and Ingun told, we were involved in volume. And this picture is for me from a great day that we had in, in Konyakov, uh, quite close uh, in the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, it was very interesting to see the milking of the sheep uh, these Ukrainian guys are making. And this was all completely new for me. So it was a lot of knowledge for us. Uh, and I hope that the Polish also made uh, learn from our visit there. Uh, this is the yarn we made in volume. It's a very coarse yarn uh, and it's uh, very suitable for rougher things like uh, carpets or, or blankets. And now, this is slow wool, and this is my first meeting with the slow wool during the very, very nice uh, uh, end meeting of, uh, of volume. We met uh, you from Slovakia, and uh, I got this uh, yellow, very nice plant-eyed yarn, and I combined it with the yarn from Blessed Sad to, to make this. Uh, uh, well, my husband says it's, it's an angry looking sheep, so maybe it is, but I think it's more like a happy looking sheep. <laughs> but I think uh, uh, I look forward to, to work together with you more. I think I hope that this will not be the last uh, thing we do together. Uh, and maybe also you would like to discuss the possible fiber shed in Slovakia. Uh, yeah, we have been working on a lot of different uh, projects. Uh, I will not tell much about that, but this project was about uh, uh, fooling. Uh, so we made uh, yarn tests for weaving, and then afterwards we we felt that these uh, textiles in the in the, the fooling process. Uh, also, high wool was what uh, Ingun mentioned. Very nice project with. Uh, with a visit in uh, in uh, Portugal, and I wanted to tell a little bit about uh, another reconstruction that we did. This is Bienestreya, and for this uh, reconstruction, we made a yarn uh, from uh, quite coarse wool uh, with long fibers, uh, and you can see. Uh, I think the cuffs of this. Um, uh, sweater is quite interesting with the stripes that goes the other way. Uh, it reminds me of the Slovakian uh, woven um, 
curves that you showed earlier today. So I was just thinking, is this something that has been wandering around in Europe for a while? Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is all I was going to say. Uh, the the for me, there's a very close connection between the Norwegian nature and the sheep. I'm a biologist, and I feel very strongly about this connection. I know that the western uh, sides, uh, countryside of Norway, would be completely different if the sheep were not there, because the sheep are keeping the landscape open. So, and just to to remind you uh, about the Båtrye, uh, I'm just now today while I listen to you, I try to weave uh, a little bit. So this is my first uh, try for a Båtrye. I I put in every leftover I can find in the spinning mill actually into the into the rye, and I think it will be very warm and nice to have in my boat in the summer. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all from me for now. Thank you, Ingvild. Uh, yes, um, question will come uh, after. We will have two more presentations uh, from Slovenia and Slovakia, and then uh, I will not do the presentation as before. Um, and um, I guess the questions, you have to remember them. So we will have them after afterwards, after two presentations about Slovakia. Okay, shall I introduce the next speaker, right? Okay. So it is it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, one of our uh, very new and much needed uh, woolen projects. Um, Martinka and Imro Vozarovsi, uh, um, they founded uh, first Minimil in Slovakia. Before that, we are together in our nonprofit organization, Ashravuna, and before that, we um, talked about uh, how we need a Minimil in Slovakia for many years, not oh, many years, a couple of years, and they were the first ones to <laughs> get the courage and get into it. So I'm very glad that she's going to tell you all about the challenges that mm -hmm. they are coping with. Ah, slovo Martinka. Díky. Počujete ma dobre? OK. Uh, tak ja si tam nahodím tú prezentáciu. I will, I will share my, my screen for you. I hope. Okay, it's me. Is it okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, I would like to kindly thank you for inviting us to talk about this uh, important team in Slovakia. Uh, we are the woolen manufactory. It's uh, created by me, Martina, and my husband, Imrich. He's over here. Uh, we are located in the middle of uh, Slovakia in a small village. It's surrounded by uh, pastures and fields. We established this mill about two years ago, and this is our way to help the situation with the Slovakian wool. Uh, the logo, as you see, the logo we use um, is the never-ending thread. It's um, the never-ending um, wool production, means the never-ending wool production, uh, as long as the sheep will live on this planet. And uh, also is the never-ending source of wool to make our lives warmer. Um, so please... <laughs> Please apologize my limited English skills. I do my best, I promise. <laughs> okay. You are good, Martinka. Don't worry. Thank you. It's all good. <laughs> okay. Um, I will talk about the 
the the first meal in Slovakia and the challenges that we face. Uh, so as we already know, with coming the um, coming uh, the cheap synthetic fibers on the market, the textile industry, especially the wool one in Slovakia, closed down one by one. Uh, dotations for uh, the sheep breeders sheep farmers decrease and uh, the value of wool decrease and there began a problem with the, the raw wool and it began to be called by the name of the waste. In the meantime, the raw wool in Slovakia is categorized as the animal byproduct which farmers should dispose of at, uh, dispose of at the slaughterhouse uh, and, and pay for its liquidation. Uh, this um, it's a bad situation. I'm convinced that uh, each fiber has its value, and we shouldn't call it waste. Just waste. Um, uh, our manufacturer is coming with the solutions for uh, for the breeders for small breeders and handcrafters for the um, their small batches of wool. Uh, we provide the scouring, carding spinning a bit of felting and also the pelletizing the the um, dirty wool the, the really waste wool we also offer our products um, from the local wool on the e-shop uh, to spread them among the the hand spinners and the hand crafters mostly Okay, this is just uh, one curious photo for uh, attract you. It is uh, how we were moving uh, moving in our machines into the mill. The mill is situated in a small small uh, family house, <laughs> which we which, which we rebuilt for this kind of uh, mill. Uh, we process um, orders from the three kilos to maybe 200 kilos of uh, raw wool. Uh, so our maximum production is about five tons of wool a year. Uh, this, this whole production in Slovakia is about 700 tons a year. So we are really, really, really small for this amount. And we are the only one. Our machines from Ramela, as you see, are designed to process sheep wool of various breeds and also other fiber animal, animal other animal fibers, the alpaca, mohair, cashmere, uh, angora. We also use the, the plant fibers. We normally process the wool mixtures with the, the flax, hemp, or cotton. Uh, we started spinning um, just uh, in this May, the, the last May. Um, uh, we are spinning with the small Canadian Belfast mini mills. It's it's four spindle machine. Uh, very soon we realized this is not gonna be enough for our inquiry, as it is increasing each month. So we are preparing for the bigger machine from Ramela. We are very happy. Okay. Uh, this is uh, this manufacturer is very rare type of business in Slovakia. We are uh, the the only one who is processing the raw wool into the final products. So there is no other scouring system in Slovakia. Uh, we are uh, our products uh, are the the buds, the rowings, and uh, the yarn, the semi worsted yarn. Uh, until this company came, um, people had no much choice, not much choice to use their wool for themselves. They could process it by hand, or uh, they they can get process it um, in uh, near Czech Republic. Uh, in Slovakia, there, there are uh, two other companies, the bigger companies, uh, who is processing the wool, but uh, they take uh, 
the, the big big amounts like up to 200 or 500 kilos and the wall have to be scoured on the income so you need to wash it somewhere before uh, we established this um, as manufacture this manufactory as a family business and we hope this way we can uh, ensure the future jobs for our kids yes there we have four kids and i'm sure the they will have enough work in this uh, in this um, area the oldest son he's draw drawing and uh, he creates the posters and stickers for us um yeah okay yeah let's see this this picture i will talk about uh how it used to be and how it is now uh the on the photo of the right is um uh, is the the waste wool um uh, used to look like this very often as we are located in, in the countryside we can see the farmers each day we are in close contact with them and we see most of them are very skeptic about the the wool situation uh, most often they they want to just get rid of the wool and um, get some money to pay at least the shearer um, for your information the shearer takes about two euros per sheep yeah it's then uh, it's on the farmers to decide um, what they want to do with the shorn wool uh they can store it and wait if somebody comes and buy it for a very low price uh, doesn't matter what what breed is it they 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 pay maybe 20 30 cents um, euro cents per kilo um most probably nobody comes to buy any uh the farmers can store it or uh, wait for um, authorities to come and accuse them of like uh, they're storing the hazardous waste it's possible <laughs> um, farmers usually burn it or dig it into the soil that's uh, another option uh, but we would like them to take a response for this shear focus at the wool processing and get the profit from it because nobody else come to save the wool. In this case, I hope wise breeders uh, will choose <laughs> to, we can help to improve the, the sheep breeding, or consult the conditions uh, of um, to breed and settle and to choose the right time of, um, of shearing, for example, to improve the shear and so it will be more clean and uh, good for processing. Uh, yeah, uh, I take this uh, as a biggest advent, uh, the biggest um, challenge for our manufacturing, but also for the the nonprofit. Uh, Lubica mentioned already uh, the nonprofit our wool uh, as I member as well. Um, it is to increase the value of Slovakian wool. And I'm not talking just about the price. Uh, the breeders simply don't know in what condition the shorn wool uh, have to be, if they want to use it or sell it. They just put everything in one bag and this is how it looks like. <laughs> it's the beginning of the end. Of the end. <laughs> okay, they, they used to say, Oh, it was good money for the wool before. Why not? What not? Why now? Not. Mm, their their grandfathers used to care about the wool much before, so it was looking like something else. Uh, I think we need to educate the, the the farmers, show them the potential of the wool. Simply, the cleaner the, and healthier your fleece is, uh, the better the end product will be. We also communicate to the shearers what condition the wool have to be uh, after shearing. 
and um, this is up to their skills. Uh, in Slovakia, there are usually no workers collecting and sorting the wool uh, at the shearing place immediately after shearing. Um, breeders just, uh, the farmers just put the all material into one bag and yeah, and this is it. We still push farmers to sort it, sort the wool uh, uh, immediately after shearing. Yeah, this is how it should be. Where will this, this will be? Uh, with this, uh, this non-profit, we also organizing the shearing work workshops. With the breeders can be trained how to get the best wool and uh, also the, the sorting. Uh, so it can be processed by hands or uh, in a mill. In our manufacturing, we also offer the courses for hand processing, uh, felting and weaving, and uh, also common knitting uh, to make handcrafters look for the, the local wool, because there is plenty of it. Yeah. In the past, the natives used to sing, sheep, sheep, triple benefit, <laughs> people used to get the, the milk, the meat, and uh, a lot of clothing from sheep, a lot of wool. Uh, now, you can buy various milk products in each supermarket here. You can eat lamp in almost each restaurant, but uh, you can, you cannot, uh, if, until Mokosha came, you cannot buy a, a bowl of uh, the, the Slovakian yarn in any store. Uh, this is one store, I think. Yeah, Lubica. What in one store you can you can buy. Uh, the um, the yarn store. On the shop. yarn stores, uh, it's maybe three or four. Ah, oh, okay. It's a better situation now. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh yeah. Actually, in our location, there are lots of sheep, the sheep breeds, uh, breeding around. Um, so you can get ju not just uh, coarse wool, but the uh, various pellets of, uh, of, um, of the wool for your crafts and needs. The long wools, the fine wools, the various colors and benefits. This is also the reason why we are happy to show people the, how the manufacturing works and what kind of products be, can be created from Slovakian wool. So, so they can touch, uh, they can feel the, the, the coarse wool, but uh, mm, they can see also the, the fine wools and the, the movement from traditional to modern kind of products. Uh, uh, we are seeing a lot of interest also in the production of the tradi traditional, the, the sukno, the woolen textile, the woolen fabric. Uh, people used to sew the traditional customs, as uh, was mentioned, the trousers and coats and uh, the vest and all uh, from this uh, sukno. They say it used to be harsh and scratch scratchy as, uh, as well as the sweaters that the grandmothers uh, knitted for them. Surely we know it's caused by the, cor uh, the coarse wool <laughs> because traditional Valashka breed was uh, grazed here mostly. Uh, then with uh, the arrival of synthetics and merino underwear later, uh, people have become simply spoiled. Yeah, I think spoiled is good good word. It's weird because the, the example, for example, the, the Nordic wool, it's almost everything is like a bit of, um, is, is not, uh, is higher microns, yeah. And uh, everybody loves the, the Lopi style yarn and uh, <laughs> why not? Um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, but fortunately, as I mentioned, there are uh, most more uh, usable sheep breeds actually uh, in Slovakia. Our merino is the not same quality as 
the South Americas, but uh, still very nice. Basically, our manufacturer doesn't provide the buyout of wool, uh, but uh, uh, in fact that we are selling some, some products on the eShop, uh, we can choose and buy raw wool from a few breeders and we would like to and we would like to pay the, the fair price. Uh, this has to be communicated well and then and when the breeders accept our conditions uh, that uh, will have to be sorted, uh, we will gladly pay this, this fair price. Mm. Everybody knows the range of woolen products is wide. Uh, so we still need uh, the Valashka and uh, also the, the fine wools, fine fibers, and also the, the mixed uh, nameless wool, which is a bit uh, here. Because we are making also the, the rag yarn, we can use anything into the rag yarn spinning. Uh, occasionally, we also buy out the Angora and alpaca fiber, the mohair, and also the flax, which is mm, planted uh, locally in Slovakia. Everything uh, as local as it's possible is fine for us. This is uh, the part of uh, our way to increase the, the value of nice, but uh, kind of uninteresting sheep breeds mostly. Uh, this can become more interesting and even luxurious. Uh, we mix Romney with the uh, alpaca, mohair or flex. Uh, so we get uh, nice, more warm, shiny on, and uh, the rustic yarn. Or uh, we mix Slovakian merino with uh, Angora mm, and yeah, I don't know cotton to make it more white, soft, and delicate. So it's more interesting. <laughs> Some of our yarn. Slide eleven. I don't know where we are. Yeah, uh, we want to Slovakian wool. Uh, to look attractive um, in the modern life, as well as um, um, here you can see the the guba in a in a modern kind of uh, rack. Uh, it's a fresh modern design. Uh, we are uh, currently seeing um, an increase in interest of uh, small brands um, of knitted clothing, also textile on, or uh, interior designers who wants to use the local wool for their products. This is good for us and uh, we would like to spread, uh, spread this um, around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, another challenge is the personal one. <laughs> As I have no textile education and never been uh, to any other fiber mill, fiber mill before we set up this uh, this our own, it's a big challenge for us to let the manufactory the right way. My husband, the co-owner of manufactory. Uh, is a um, wise and intelligent, very pr practical man, but uh, never tried uh, hand spinning or weaving. <laughs> so uh, mm, he he already began on, with felting, but uh, honestly, uh, he is not helpful. <laughs> it's just technician. Uh, I often just follow my intuition about the fibers and the mixtures. Uh, also for the designing the yarns, I'm not a good knitter. I am learning everything as, as I go and have luck that good smart friends are around to help if I need something. <laughs> Sometimes I see any the idea in, in the internet and I 
And I say, oh, I'll try it tomorrow. And I'll try tomorrow and voila, it works. <laughs> and I feel happy on these days. Yeah, happy. <laughs> yes, this is a, a great lesson for both of us and uh, we do our best. Okay, some words for uh, what we are looking for, the future holds. <laughs> We we would like to stabilize as we are the this is just the second year of the manufacturing. We would like to stabilize and a little expand. Uh, support more breeders who see the value of wool by the, the buyout of their wool for the fair price. We need to expand the manufacturing by, by a larger capacity spinning machine. As, the, as we need it. Uh, then we can spread the DAE shop um, to make handcrafters focus on the local wool rather than abroad. And um, also we need uh, to find the follow-up producers to make more final products uh, from our semi-finished products. I mean, uh, for example, pillows or duvets or a kind of uh, felting and something. Yeah, and we we would like to help the public better understand the diversity of wool and uh, the benefits by staying the door open for the excursions so people can touch different types of wool. I think this is important so they can change their their what they thought yeah this is i think this is yeah this is it thank you for your attention this is a few contacts from us thank yeah, you so like, much yeah. martina both <laughs> from the for your speech and for your amazing work uh, it is so good uh, that uh, people uh, uh, dare uh, to start uh, and to change things. And I don't know whether you know or whether uh, all the listeners know, uh, but the problems that uh, you are facing in Slovakia with so much wool uh, going lost uh, mm -hmm. is the same problem all around uh, EU. Uh, and it is like uh, Tun and I try to sum up uh, where is it good uh, sort um, collecting and sorting systems and where are most of the wool lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and we came up with the number that was the best we could do. And that was that 80% of the EU wool is lost. And that's quite high. Mm -hmm. So it's not only in Slovakia. This problem is uh, is all around Europe. With some, uh, you know, some countries that uh, that the, are doing differently. I mean, uh, the UK, Iceland, Norway, mm -hmm. uh, but 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 mostly. Uh, and then you talked about this with touching, and I am touching all the time. I'm sitting here and touching and touching, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, um, and that is the mucosa wool, and that is the, our last uh, speak. Uh, and we think that is good to end with the start, uh, because the start, as I explained in the beginning, uh, was that um, uh, Tone and Ingvel and, and, and me uh, actually met the wool, uh, and these two uh, ladies uh, <laughs> that now is going to present. And we did hear them present in Poland and we were most impressed uh, by by the work uh, but also that uh, the wool was so interesting so uh, I'm touching and I hope uh, uh, on a later occasion that many of the of you in Norway will mm -hmm. uh, also have the opportunity to touch the wool so uh, <laughs> then we will have the last um, presentation okay it's our time. Uh, before our presentation, thanks, Martinka. That was awesome. And you needn't worry about your English or your presentations anymore. Okay. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm looking for your one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Luby, do you want to introduce ourselves or we just do it through the presentation? <laughs> yeah, just share the screen and we we will okay. see everything we need. So uh, I'm going to introduce ourselves. Um, it is a bit difficult because our work with wool goes several ways. <laughs> Um, we are here now, two of us, uh, me, Lubica, and uh, Alenka, my colleague, and uh, we founded um, a Slovak, little Slovak woolen brand, Mokosha. But before, we both uh, have been uh, hand spinners for many years, and uh, uh, then uh, we founded uh, with other people like-minded people who uh, who were looking into the situation of Slovak wool, we founded this uh, non-profit organization, Our Wool, which in Slovak is uh, Nasza Luna. Um, and we are now going to tell you more about our enterprises and challenges and the work we do. Okay, yeah. I start. <laughs> okay, so as Lubica uh, said, this presentation will be a little bit of a mixture between the non-profit organization Nasha Volna and our brand Mokosha. So we will maybe change through the presentation because uh, so you hear both of us a little more. And uh, yeah, I would begin with the quote that uh, kind of encapsulates the current state of the bull in Slovakia and perhaps resonates with many of us which are gathered here today because um, as was being said this is the situation also in the other countries so just for the bigger impact I will read it out loud so <laughs> wool is not only in Slovakia but also everywhere in the area an underestimated material I would say that we are beginning to call it waste it has one fault it doesn't burn if it burned we would burn it so this is uh, uh, really reflecting the harsh reality facing the wool industry, not only in Slovakia, as I said, and despite its uh, rich history and variability, as we discussed, wool is often overlooked and undervaluated. And thanks to the initiatives, like we just heard the perfect first Slovak mini mill, things are slowly changing, but um, there is still quite some way to go. Uh, but before we talk about the initiatives, I will just bring up a few numbers. And um, this is also Zuzka in the morning blog. She talked about like the decline of the wool production in Slovakia. So I will not really go to much details about it, but basically the uh, decline of the wool production and the sheep population in Slovakia happened mostly in the 1990s. And this can be attributed to the several factors which we already discussed. Uh, but like, so the first of this would be the um, change in demand. And uh, as the beginning of the free market and import of the new materials led to the increasing demand for softer wool, such as Merino, which then led to the distortion of the wool from other sheep breeds available in Slovakia. And uh, consumer preferences for specific types of wool have shifted, and this obviously affected the demand um, of the wool from traditional Slovak sheep breeds. And uh, this is something what we discussed also, as Martinka said, that uh, it's the itchiness of the wool and people uh, often we hear it at the markets with Lubica, like that people have this trauma from some <laughs> itchy grandma pullover. And uh, once you say that you are selling Slovak wool, everybody gets freaked out because it will definitely be itchy. And it bring, brings back this terrifying memories of uh, itchy wool and pullovers. So we are trying obviously to change this situation. And while I was just like going through the presentation, I had this side note, uh, which we were also discussing in the previous blog, like what happened with the knitting in Slovakia or like the use of the wool. And I just remembered we talked about this in Poland as well, that back during the communist regime, if you wanted to stand out with some fashion item, the the, the 
the items you could buy in Tuzex were very limited. So if you wanted to stand out, you had to like make it yourself. So many people were knitting or sewing back then. Um, and uh, my mom and my uh, aunt actually had the side business of knitting. And this could be funny for Norwegian people because one of the popular and most desired pullover design was something with Norwegian stars. So this was very famous. And then <laughs> once the 90s came back and suddenly you could buy everything, all the fashion you could imagine, people kind of stopped to do this. And only like when I started to knit, my mom was totally freaking out. Like, why do you knit? You can buy it and not even mentioning the spinning. And now we feel with Lubica that the younger generation is like bringing this tradition back a little bit. So this could be, for example, also one of the reasons. The other one is definitely also the quality of the wool itself. Uh, because as you can see, uh, the significant portion of the sheep in Slovakia, which is uh, bred today, like 80%, is mostly for milk production. And maybe many people know and many people don't know about this, but there is quite a difference between the quality of the wool depending on the breed and uh, on how you how the sheep is used. So if you um, breed the sheep mostly for milk production, the quality of the wool is lesser, for example, than if you breed the sheep for meat production because of the amount of the nutrients which goes then to the wool. And since the uh, production of the milk or sheep milk was so highly emphasized, this could also lead to the uh, decline of the wool quality. And then obviously there are the economical factors which were discussed already before. So now the sheep sharing cost is between 120 to 2 euros per sheep. And the price for raw fleece, you can see definitely how it dropped from the 1990s. So it used to be eight, more or less eight euros per kilo. And now it's 10 cents or 20 cents, or exactly as we already said, like it's discarded, nobody wants it. People have to get rid of it. And uh, this is a big problem, obviously, for the uh, shepherds. And also, as uh, was already said, the number of shearers is low in Slovakia, of the skilled shearers. And uh, basically, last but not least, without the viable markets mm -hmm. to sell the wool uh, and the few places where to process wool, well, only the minimal if you want to do it in a small quantity, um, it just makes it incredibly difficult to sustain the woolen process going on and uh, luckily things are changing. And this is basically also the processing challenges which we had with Lubica in the beginning because when we started there was no mini mill and uh, we will probably tell more about our story later on in the presentation but there is basically no place to wash wool. Yes, now in the in the Volnarenska Manufaktura there is, but as Maćka said, they are still kind of a low capacity. So there is no bigger washing place in Slovakia. And the two last big mills have a very, very high minimal limit amount for the processing of the wool. So this was one of the major challenges we were like facing when we started Mokosha. And this is actually still kind of one of our problems because Minimil is way too small of a capacity and the huge factory is way too big for us. So something in the middle would be ideal, but we yeah. will see. Which is, which is something that we are facing this year. Yeah. <laughs> it seems that we are selling out our, <laughs> our yeah. stock. And we have to find out how to process the all the kilos of the fleece we have, right, Lubi? We will find yes, out. And which we will have. <laughs> okay. So I will leave you to explain the woolen circle and yes. then we'll come back. Yes. So uh, the, the woolen circle is kind of my and not my uh, terminology that was um, that was an insight I was having while we were uh having a conference in Slovakia um which was one of our like non-profit organization uh, attempts to bring the topic uh to the government and we had this this meeting with um 
uh, uh, people from the Ministry uh, of Agriculture and uh, with uh, um, we got together people from the mills and um, uh, from previous mills and uh, from the uh, Breeders Association and so on and uh, they were talking in the beginning um, about all these like large scale businesses, how it has to work, how we have to wash all Slovak wool, and what uh, enormous equipment uh, we have to buy, and so on. And uh, we've been thinking that they are missing uh, a point, and the point is uh, the connections. Um, because it seemed that they were seeing just um, a very simple connection that we have this amount of uh, local wool, so we have to process it and wash it. But uh, the connections there are, there is many more connections than just that. And uh, we, as maybe as women, <laughs> That can be our input uh, into the way of thinking, because we see it all more as a circle, which is, it has really no beginning, but let's begin uh, um, with the breeders and shepherds and uh, the animals and uh, the quality of wool. Because as Ingrid said, how the sheep are bred is, uh, um, directly influencing the quality of the fiber, of course. And then some fiber will be uh, perfect for textiles, another one for rugs, and another one for fertilizers, and uh, another one for insulations. And we can use all of it. But as also Martinka said, um, um, since this, it, it took maybe one or two generations to see that the information was just lost and we have to re-educate ourselves and re-educate the shepherds, the breeders, the shearers, the producers, the knitters, uh, the customers, just every point of the woolen circle needs more information about how it all is connected. So, uh, if we managed to educate slowly the breeders uh, that could support the farmers because they could um, use the knowledge to raise the quality of their fiber and um, then get the fair price for the wool. Um, and with quality wool, of course, we can then work further and uh, we can raise the demand for the local wool because uh, when we educate the customers as well, uh, which we do very, very much, and that is um, also one of our challenges uh, with Mokosha, as we are first uh, local wool brand, we see that we have to work with uh, people and with customers and with knitters and so on very much uh, because um, as we said, they are often afraid of local wool, and yes, it will not be as soft as merino, but it will be mm, mm, most of the time more, much more durable. And uh, these are the, the information that people uh, often don't have. They see just the, the difference within the softness and not uh, the other added values. And um, uh, with this, it, it's almost exactly what Martinka was speaking about, but let's put a term on it. And this term is breed specific wool. Uh, in Slovak, so the Slovaks understand, we call it plemena vlna. And it means that the fiber is uh, sorted according to the breed. And we talk about this a lot, uh, 
I'm also teaching uh, courses and producing many uh, new uh, spinners. And we always, always talk about breed specific, breed specific fiber because there is more than thousands, four, 1400 registered uh, breeds of sheep and every uh, breed has a different wool. So it doesn't mean that if wool is uh, coarse, I can't wear it. It just means that I can't wear this specific wool, but if I make a rug out of it, it will last for 30 years. And I can reach for a different breed specific yarn and that will work perfectly as a sweater. Okay, what else? Okay, and yes, and uh, uh, the raised demand from the customers then of course can help with um, uh, enterprises as minerals, other pro other processors, manufacturers, or or uh, companies, mm, because so far <laughs> they have quite a lot of work, but um, I think the the demand could be way way higher. Well, so uh, now to the interconnection of our woolen projects. So uh, as I mentioned, um, um, the, the first logos is our small hand spinners logos of me and uh, Alenka. Um, we've been hand spinning for many years. And uh, as I have been hand spinning, and even before I met Alenka, uh, I started to look for uh, local wool because, of course, I was spinning the fancy hand dyed merino tops uh, in the start. But uh, then I heard about the breed specific principle and I wanted to spin local wool. So I tried out many, many breeds and their wools and started to compare and um, on the base of that I found other people uh, who were doing the same thing and we founded the non-profit organization which um, which was founded in uh, 2018 I think and uh, we started making um, lessons and courses and uh, um, it concentrated uh, several people who all have their own woolen projects, as is, for example, Martinka and the manufacturing, um, uh, as is our Mokosha. And then there is um, uh, another brand, Gubanya, uh, which is another friend of ours who, um, um, who concentrated uh, hand knitters uh, around a small city in Slovakia, and um, they have this uh, lookbook of patterns, and you can um, you can have your garment made on commission. Yeah. Okay, so um, our non-profit organization is concentrating mainly on um, um, information spreading, uh, networking, of course, um, because we try to connect all the people who work with wool in Slovakia. We teach uh, hand processing of wool. Uh, we started to organize shearing lessons as well. And uh, we try and uh, help other people to um, try to make the comeback of local wool to the market and improve its quality and spread the information and everything that. Uh, okay, these are uh, some of our um, uh, some of our um, actions that you can find on our website. Um, uh, on the right side, there is an interactive map that we are quite proud of because 
um, we soon found out that um, there is quite a lot of people in Slovakia who are working with wool somehow or are trying to work with wool, but they think they are alone in their region. So we created a map uh, where uh, anybody who writes to us, we will um, pinpoint uh, them on the map and so they can find in their own region uh, whether there is anyone else who, for example, teaches courses, uh, shears, um, breeds sheep, uh, spins, and whatever. Um, then we, of course, teach courses, which are weekend courses, quite intensive, and they are wonderful. We have wonderful feedback. Uh, every time there is a great group of people. And um, then on the top, you see uh, a poster from uh, a festival of wool that we have made for the first time last year. And we are repeating it this year uh, because mm, it was quite well received. And uh, what we wanted to do was again, uh, connect the people first and uh, concentrate all the spinners and wool workers on uh, one spot because many of us know about each other uh, via internet but we've never met uh, so uh, now the thing was very very um, pleasant because we just saw this communication buzzing among all those um, spinners and uh, the second goal of the festival was to show public uh, what does it mean today to spin and what range a hand spinning has because some of us use spindles, some of us use old spinning wheels, some of us use uh, hyper modern hybrid uh, mothercraft uh, spinning wheels. And uh, it's everything, and everything uh, works out together wonderfully. So uh, when you attend this festival, you can try something out. You will see uh, some lectures. You can see uh, shearing of sheep right on the stage and uh, meet many, many people who do this wonderful craft. Okay. Okay, uh, oh. so this is another of our uh, wonderful enterprises, which you heard everything about in last presentations. We are very oh. proud of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the the Gubanya that I've been talking about, and um, uh, as you heard the presentations in the in the morning, uh, this is exactly the the modern twist on the old style buba, uh, which is that chunky vest uh, or a coat or a carpet with um, loose ends woven into the fabric. And that's where they drew their name from. Okay. So you have the, the website there and, yeah. and you can look them up. Okay, and and... I, introduction of us to you. <laughs> now back to us. Okay, but you are <laughs> so many things, you know. So <laughs> now, but back to the roots. So as Lubica said, we've been spinners and knitters for quite some time. And we actually randomly met on some Facebook uh, chat. Uh, I think it was to order ply magazines uh, via like of different spinners. And then we immediately started to talk. And as Lubica said, there were like many people are doing things with wool in Slovakia, but we did not know about each other and the non-profit organization did not exist yet. So we were both trying to do the same thing, but Lubica in, in Pezinok and me in Prague because I live in Prague. And uh, uh, yeah, we just like, we were looking for Slovak wool. And I remember people sending me packages of very, very, very dirty wool to Prague, which I then tried to wash in my bathtub, clothing the 
tubes of the flat uh, with lanolin and hand carding it and then spinning it and then trying to sell it to people and they would be like okay we are not going to pay for this because it's just too much <laughs> so uh we we were st and then we met for the first time in person actually on in 2017 and immediately we knew that we want to go on this mission together and it only took us four years to <laughs> bring mokosha alive yeah. That in those four years, that felt like a mission impossible. That was like a detective work where we asked and searched and digged in the undergrounds of where could we process the wool or for waiting months for some answer on an email, even to find an information where could we process the wool. And this was such a journey, <laughs> complicated from the beginning, so we can be only really proud of what we achieved uh, so far, I think. And also, it's just basically two of us doing everything from the visuals and the design and the marketing and uh, Lubica writing the beautiful texts and uh, uh, shipment from Pezinok and manually widening each skin and each cake of yarn. Oh, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and me uh, bull dyeing all the mystery clubs in a very, very small kitchen in the Panelak in Praha. And uh, so it's been a learning curve. So we are very grateful for uh, every single order and every single customer and <laughs> every single comment we receive. And uh, so what we try to achieve, this is like basically already been said so many times, but it's good to repeat it again. So our goals in Mokosha is basically to bring back the machine processed wool and to support local mills uh, or the big ones or the small ones like Manufaktura. And so the Slovak wool can come back to the creative hands of people. Because as I said, like um, hand spun wool or hand spun yarn is doesn't really have such a big impact on the market uh, because of its price. And this is maybe something different in Nor Norway because the economical capacity of the population might be different, but also like rewarding the craft itself because people many times they just don't realize what all it takes to actually come up with the skin of yarn when you hand spin it. And so exactly the comeback of the Slovak wool to kind of reconnect the tradition and the present. And uh, we just want to really save as much of the wool as possible and the fair price, both for the customers and the shepherds. This was also discussed many times. And we just would really like to support the breeders to take care of the flocks and produce the quality wool sorted correctly. And then we are willing to pay the fair price. And the concept of the breed specific wool was also discussed so many times because like every wool is good for something else. And uh, yeah, and then we also try to spread the knowledge about the breed specific wool or like we write articles you, on our blog, you can really read about every single breed we are using in our yarn and we are trying to really educate our customers about why is it good to do things from our local wool and this is a little bit of our products what we have so as we said we have uh, breed specific yarns or in natural or hand dyed uh, ways then we have the comp tops or spinners spin boxes uh, which is quite nice because they're the mm, hand spinners can test different breeds which we offer also with some carded buds then we have the hand dyed fibers as i said uh, done in the kitchen or uh, in lubica's kitchen when it comes to plant dyeing <laughs> mostly and then we started to run the mystery club which is pretty successful i would say also the wool um which uh, was uh, showing in which is in Norway that's also like our October or September mystery club I think um, if I remember correctly so this awesome. is a, yeah this is a very nice project which uh, we are happy that people are liking and then we have also the wool processing tools like spindles and comb top um, the combs to wool combs. wool combs yes and also we are selling the book which Lubica wrote which is actually the first book uh, about bull processing in Slovakia or hand processing in Slovakia. 
And then, yeah, because, and then we also do natural dye packages, knitting patterns. And I think that's all to be our <laughs> to <lose> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I think this is yeah. This is uh, this is it. But you can check our website. We stretched our time as well. Yeah. Sorry for we that. We reached the time, but that's it anyway because the video was not working. So we would finish it just with the uh, invitation for the next year or this year actually of the festival. You are all very much welcome. It's happening in the beautiful nature. Uh, in Western Tatras, it's just like a Woon retreat, and uh, it's just great. You should all come when, if you can. If we can uh, find some good travel projects for Norwegians. Yes. <laughs> and and since there was the demand for uh, like the sl the Slovak vocabulary, which we actually wanted to include in the beginning. Okay. But we forgot, and um, so here is a little bit of. Uh, what you say how in Slovak. So, <laughs> okay, we'll be... so sheep, sheep is ovca, fleece is called runa, wool is called vlna, that's a mouthful, <laughs> comb top is tesanet, yarn is called priada, cane, pradeno, shipping wheel, spinning wheel, sorry. I'm already shipping on this. <laughs> Spinning wheel, colorat, weaving loom, crossna, knitting is called plefinie, embroidery, vishilka, and pole costume is called kroy. Okay. Hi. And thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Stopping to share the screen now. Yeah, and Thank you so much for the presentation and the little uh, language uh, education in the end. Uh, and I noticed another uh, word that came up and and that was rug. Rug. It, mm -hmm. Rug, you Cotton. said? Uh, no, it, it, uh, rug is English word. So oh, yeah. So that was an English word. Then I misunderstood. Okay. Um, yes, thank you. And, and in this it is it's impressive uh, and uh, I mean so much handwork uh, and so much thinking and so big um, uh, goals uh, and um, yes you need really two women to do all this I mean that's <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> yes and um, um, now we will have a uh, first uh, questions to these yeah. three presentations yeah. And afterwards, we will have a discussion about um, um, the whole uh, webinar, but also possibilities to contribute with something in the direction of more cooperation between Slovakia and Norway when it comes to wool and the work with um, uh, costumes as well. And then um, I also wanted to say that in the beginning, I said that we will have uh, that we have a wool project going on in Norway and um, uh, one of them is called Amazing Gracing and they have a website uh, so if we manage everything with the with the um, with the, the recording uh, we will have that on on the website to Amazing Gracing uh, and the website that uh, uh, all the project that the CIFO is involved in is called Clothing Research and I guess that someone can put it in the chat so you can find it, but because I don't think that has been a part of uh, one of the presentations. So that's the same place that you uh, might have found the link to the webinar, uh, but maybe we should give you also the mm -hmm. link directly before the discussion. Because I think it is good to talk about this now, because it might be that someone has to leave us, and then it's good that they have the most, uh, you know, crucial information um, uh, before the discussion. Yes, um, I know it has been a lot of activities about, uh, on the Quina, hasn't it? Or how is that going? No questions. It's that maybe then I see in the chat. Yeah, in the chat there is many questions. Yes, in the chat is the many thing. You you know it is like confusing that it's both chat and Q and A. Mm, the chat. 
I think nobody is using Q and A. So okay, only easy. only um, only the chat. This is the question. Yeah. Uh, the how did you manage the legal environmental standards requirements for your mini mill? This is for me, I think. Can I answer this? Yes, sure. <laughs> okay. I was uh, uh, yeah, everybody was uh, scaring us that this is impossible. This is going to be um, too much money for make it like legal but it's not uh, before we set up the mill uh, we asked the competent uh, what uh, requirements uh, uh, such uh, an, um, an operation should meet um, um, no one could give us uh, a proper answer like uh, they said probably you should set up as a diary production so you need to have uh, the white walls and uh, like hygienic and uh, this is it uh, like nobody is counting with the fact uh, that uh, anyone would process the wool mm, so uh yeah and if uh, if you ask Lucia, if you ask about the, the waste wool, uh, it is uh, exported from us to a local purification center. It is all legal, like no big challenge. Yeah, did you feel you uh, finished the answer? Is it good? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. There I is another, add... another for you, Martinka. There is another question for you. Yeah, Simon. I, I, I wrote him already. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, perhaps, Ingvila, Ingvila, are you still uh, there? Because um, you also had some thoughts around the, the, um, the um, uh, effluent uh, waters, I think, and and how that's handled, but um, of course it's it's the uh, uh, also the question about um, uh, the tr uh, how wool is defined as uh, waste, which is what Simon brought up. So maybe we can um, uh, allow Simon to explain a little bit more around that um, mm -hmm. exactly how it works. Um, I, I, I'm going to allow Simon to talk. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello, Simon. Hello. Hi, Simon. Uh, the reason that I, I brought the subject is that uh, the European Wool Association has been looking at various countries, various sites across Europe. Mm -hmm. Can't find a common approach to the interpretation of the 2002 EU regulation which says that wool is a biohazard until it's been scoured. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in many countries, many different solutions are being applied. In the UK, there seems to be a freedom of trade, and now they freely trade fleeces between one place and another. We've just been to an event in Sweden where, again, uh, greasy raw wool fleeces are on public display and are uh, seen for evaluation and a competition, and then they're sold freely. But if you go to Italy, then it's actually a criminal offense to uh, anybody to handle raw wool apart from a licensed premises for collection, grading, and sorting of wool. Uh, in Ireland, it seems to be different regulations that they can uh, apply wool, raw wools uh, across the countryside. Uh, in other countries, they come down hard because they think it's a biohazard. And in fact, even in it, returning to Italy now, they're even considering that handling raw wool is dangerous to human health because of the uh, the various uh, nasties that could be uh, growing in raw wool. So I was asking Slovakia because Slovakia is an interesting country, maybe to start a a pilot project for a wool collection center through ever. And uh, mm -hmm. eventually, we'd like to know what the Slovakian interpretation of that regulation is. 
So it may be not for now to answer, but in the future. Yeah, so I this said... is where it comes from. It's, it's every country seems to have a different interpretation of handling that war. Thank you so much, Simon, for your question and uh, and also your explanation. And thank you also for last time. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's it's nice, and I think it's um, it's a very good question. Uh, and I, before someone tries to answer it, I would like to add something. Uh, and that is that uh, Tuna and I have been very active in um, discussing the EU textile strategy, which is a very ambitious strategy. And it's now two years old uh, and it's uh, containing uh, at least 16 different political um, tools. Uh, to change the textile system in EU. Uh, and most interestingly, uh, it's not one single word about local production or wool uh, or other uh, natural resources in uh, EU or the remains of the textile industry in EU. So it is like um, the textile strategy in EU is completely without any contact with the history or with the nature in EU, or with the culture of textiles and clothing, which EU, uh, which is, it's such a great part of why Europe became rich in the first place. So it's like it's it's like something really is lacking, um, and I. I, uh, I think what you tell us about now with all these different definitions and all these different rules, we can also see this in other part of the textile system that is no clear definition. The, for instance, the codes for trading textiles is very often differently uh, understood. You, I mean, trade with second hand is also like someone, you know, it's, it's very like um, no real definitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the most used terms like fast fashion, for instance, isn't de defined. So I think what you are telling about is 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 just like the tip of the uh, iceberg. Of course, it's most interesting for the discussion we have today. Uh, but it's it's like this all over the place. I mean, when it comes uh, to the textile value chain, and it doesn't seem to be that these problems that we are discussing uh, the local uh, natural resources and traditions in uh, Europe and EU included are going to be included in the work with the textile strategy. And that is, uh, in my eyes, maybe the biggest weakness with the strategy, because it's like what they want uh, uh, is not included. You know, saying that fast fashion should be out of fashion is nice, but what is the alternative? Isn't that Small scale local production, so it's like uh, that's not included. So um, it, that's an interesting not uh, answer, but comment. But now I will let the Slovakians uh, reflect on your question. Ako? <laughs> Uh, as, as I said, the, uh, the Slovakian wool is not the, the bio hazard. Um, it's, uh, my husband is a lawyer. He's, um, he found in a legislative, like uh, the wool is just the animal byproduct that should be destroyed. It's not uh, like uh, very hazardous, like... Mm. It just kind of. <laughs> oh. Well, to be to be honest, it, across the whole of the European Union, it is legally a category three biohazard mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in every member every member state. Uh, it did, what yeah. happens is is the way they they deal with it. Uh, the regulation does prescribe certain methods for its handling or its destruction if not utilized what it actually doesn't say which is good in the regulation it doesn't say it's a waste uh, it's mm -hmm. an animal byproduct which mm -hmm. has to be utilized in a certain way uh, i think we should in one way we should get away from calling it waste all the time yes. what we have a problem with is 
underutilized resources or an under a not utilized wool resource. It's not not particularly a waste. It, it's something that we we discard rather than. Uh, I think we need to change our thinking a little bit about that, calling it waste all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there there will be a Slovakian reg regulation, and it would be enforced by your veterinary authorities if they enforce it. Which you know, in Poland, they they they're very uh, relaxed about it. Uh, in the UK, okay, they're becoming more relaxed now. A third of the wool is not going through the wool marketing board anymore. In Ireland, they seem very relaxed, and in Ita Italy, they're fanatic about control. So, mm. oh, you know, it's it's. Again, it's like a common agricultural policy, 27 member states, 27 versions of the same rule. And uh, mm -hmm. like uh, you said, you know, all the way through the value chain, and we're going to get 27 versions of the same same regulation. Yes. Um, thank you again. And I think now Lisbeth has asked for the for uh, to say something. You have your hand raised, Lisbeth. Yes, I, I just thought this is a super interesting discussion on how, how legislation is interpreted. Uh, we were looking at very specifically at this text for a for an article last year. And then it seems very clear somehow in the English version that the category three byproduct is non-hazardous to human health. But the first thing that is said about it is that it should be, or like the first disposal method is to burn it or to bury it. And then you have to like go very far down on the list to, to have any suggestions of it being used, which is quite fascinating in a sense where, yeah, it's not, yeah. Um, so so um, from there to, to then think labeling it as hazardous it's quite a big step in in interpreting the the uh, legislation and and in saying that you have to bury it or you have to get rid of it um so yeah this is this is a legislative um, confusion no mess that would be good to sort out definitely it's very fascinating how they how they look at it in italy um, the the um, uh, paper that Elizabeth is referring to now uh, is one of the papers in the volume project, uh, and it is about uh, um, how the the caution rule from Poland can be utilized better. And uh, the discussion is also about not only the properties of the wool, but also the market and the legislation. Um, um, hinders uh, for better utilizing uh, and all these papers you can download load from our website so if you go to the clothing research and choose wool you will find everything that we have written about wool so also this uh, this paper in the volume project and um, is it more about this now is it more comments to this discussion about uh, the ruling and the waste or not waste I think sometimes we say wasted, and that's not the same as waste. You know, that things get, got wasted is, is, is a fact, uh, but that's not necessarily the same as calling it waste. Um, so um, then we can move on to other question. Um, I go from bottom and up, and I see that it is... Um, a question about education the breeders on aspects of improving wool quality through selection quality sharing and wool sorting as well as educating processors craft people and young generation and that's uh, uh, like a mouthful <laughs> to do all that um, in the cruise project that we had in Norway we were working with a lot of these things uh, and one of the things we actually made that might be helpful was actually a little box uh, to the farmers uh, with uh, these that makes things bigger. So you actually could look at the wool uh, out, in, uh, not a micro microscope, but a smaller thing. Um, and that could be very helpful to, to, sh to quicker have a look at the wool. So we can show you later this box if you like. That was uh, some of the things we made. 
to make also more education for um, for breeders. Um, but now again we have Simon. Ingun. Uh, yes. I showed the picture of that uh, instrument in my presentation, so they have the picture of it. They have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because this was, you know, one thing that education is many things. It's also making it easier to have access to tools that can make it easier. And um, and we also made like small films uh, about better wool handling. Uh, but of course, this is, you know, a huge area uh, because uh, uh, farmers and breeding one thing, um, sharing, sorting, and then, of course, the consumers. Um, so it's a long, 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 long list of of different kind of education and different possibilities. Um, I, I would like to to just add a, a short comment to the uh, the legislation system because in Norway, I think when we started the spinning mill, I I don't think anyone actually. Uh, inside Norway was thinking about wool as waste at all. It was always think everyone thought that this was a resource. But uh, the community had a problem with defining what uh, the wash water from the scouring of the wool was. So we discussed it a little bit with the community and then uh, the answer from the from the local community was that you, you should consider yourself as comparable to a dairy farm and we can compare your uh, scouring uh, water uh, with, the, with the milk scouring <laughs> washing system so uh, and that was exactly the same that is said for the Slovakian minimal so it's uh, I think uh, the thinking in the practical life could be quite similar as long as there is not that huge scouring plants for hundreds of tons I think that I find that the interesting and it's also a part of the thinking local system that it, it's not that complicated as if you put up a huge factory. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, Simon, is it, uh, are you still on this discussion? Do you want to, uh, to continue your uh, question? No, no, I oh, think I, I finished. I, I would oh, okay. only suggest, the, the I only suggest in, in yeah. that, you know, collectively we ought to be lobbying for uh, renew, uh, revising or looking at that original legislation from 2002, because it was actually introduced just as a reaction to foot and mouth disease, uh, uh, a Zuno's knee, uh, disease break in the UK. And it was actually inspired by the UK uh policy makers to put that regulation in place. Now the UK, in fact, is if you look at the newest version post Brexit of that regulation, now they've approximized EU law into British law again, they've taken all out of that category. So, mm. so no, no, I finished on that subject. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another comment, uh, but that is more um, a comment, uh, not a question. But we do have a question, and and that is to Martina, do you uh, cooperate with other manufacturers uh, as such as Vlnarske, Savodi Pulana or something? Yes, uh, you are good. <laughs> good. Are there any others? Uh, are you networked? And that's, uh, of course, mm -hmm. also an uh, interesting question. It could be uh, networking with others uh, in other countries, even though you say you, you were alone in Slovakia. So, could you answer this question? Uh, no, I didn't. I can I can answer now. Uh, we do not cooperate with the Polana. They they just don't answer the phones, <laughs> <laughs> the calls. Like they don't they, they don't talk. Uh, but uh, we cooperate a little with um, the other manufacturing. Uh, this is a big factory, <laughs> big, tex big textile factory. In uh, uh, it's Aspera in uh, Chatza. It's um, close to um, Polish uh, borders. Uh, yeah, we can we can help. They can help us if if we need. Uh, um, for example, uh, um, a big amount of uh, yarn 
that our machine with uh, for uh, for um, uh, what spindles spindles yeah for spindles can't process <laughs> okay so if we have a big amount of uh, rowings we can send them to to spin well this is the only cooperation that we have <laughs> Uh, if I can answer that too, uh, mm -hmm. um, that's the, you know, in the past there were uh, quite more uh, uh, big mills that processed wool, but many of those um, stopped working or uh, um, maybe two years ago, uh, uh, Plus, well, like the third one uh, ended its function because the lady was already so old and there was no one to buy the factory from her and uh, continue. Um, and so these last two big meals are just dimensionally much bigger and uh, um, the low limit of the wool that can be processed there is like a ton. So, you know, it's, uh, they never processed only wool. They process also different fibers, like uh, technical fibers, synthetics, um, I'm not sure if cotton or whatever, plant fibers. Uh, so wool was always just a part of uh, what they have been doing. And uh, they are, as soon as the big industry in Slovakia uh, declined, uh, the demand for their services for Slovak uh, market declines along with it. So uh, for many years after the revolution, they um, concentrated on uh, markets abroad. Mm -hmm. So when we cooperated with them, they just didn't believe us that we wanted to concentrate on the Slovak market and bring local wool to our market. They thought it was not really possible. And um, so they're kind of, uh, both of them are quite rigid in the older system uh, in which they have been working for many years and they just don't produce things for uh, Slovakia, they don't really have websites, uh, you can't really find out information, it's very difficult to to cooperate with them. That's exactly what Alenka mentioned in our presentation, that we sometimes like waited for months for an answer. If we didn't go there personally and uh, made them talk to us. Like beg them almost, you know, and then they were like, okay, so this is this is not enough. Okay, maybe in a half a year, we will find a small spot where we can throw your bull in. But anyway, this makes no sense what you try to achieve. This will never work. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. The words of discouragement were pretty <laughs> present the whole time. So Technically, they do exist, <laughs> but in reality, it's very, very difficult. Unreachable. To operate, yeah. Hmm. Uh, this, to to było w Polanie czy w Czacji? Alenka. Sorry to hear this, uh, but it is, I think it is also an ex uh, experience that others has. Uh, that uh, it is difficult with the the, the big ones, uh, and this is uh, the, I think this is um, um, an experience that we have seen from other places as well, uh, both when it comes to actually work together, but also to understand what is what are you trying to do, and that's yeah. uh, maybe the most important thing. Yeah. But then. Uh, this isn't the same that uh, to cooperate with others isn't good. It's just that we have to find, you know, um, um, groups of people and companies that actually can work together. And uh, we we think that's uh, that is um, uh, very fruitful 
Uh, and of course, uh, the textile value chain is so complicated that in so many different tasks that has to be done, and very often all of them have to be on pl in place at the same time to make everything work. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's a chain. So it's, it's one yeah. chain missing and then everything is falling apart again. So it's uh, um, it's it's very complicated the value chain to work with, mm -hmm. uh, but we but, have um, other but, questions uh, and, we and actually sorry, just, just yeah? one more note. Uh, I I don't want it to sound um, you know as as they are not willing. The people are fine, uh, and we do understand uh, their point of view. You know because it's quite different. Uh, if they are the generation that uh, who saw it work, and then they saw it decline, and they are very skeptical about the you know mm -hmm. this day and and wool in Slovakia, and we came into the process later with uh, seeing the situation as not functional, and uh, we are gathering the energy and uh, <laughs> all the I don't know, um, uh, willingness to, uh, to start over again, which is not really something that they have capacity to do. Mm. Okay, then we go back to the chat, nor to yeah to the chat, and one uh, another question that is also about legal things, and it is also to Martina is uh, about requirements uh, for the environmental standards. Um, oh, she, she already answered that. Yeah. Oh, she has answered that. Yeah, okay, that the then we don't one. need to take that one. Then we have someone saying beautiful work. And of course, we we do agree. Um, Can yes. I chime in here for a second? Yeah. Because I think that uh, when we come further up in the chat and also leftover question from um, uh, this morning, Mm -hmm. uh, was more um, uh, related to questions, I guess, from uh, Slovakia uh, about Norway. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I see some of the questions here are related to the Norwegian value chain, because now, of course, um, uh, we've been talking a lot uh, about the Slovakian uh, value chain. And um, uh, the questions are, for example, that is Norway self-sufficient in raw wool uh, supplies for hand spinners and also for the textile industry? Uh, how uh, uh, does the textile industry in Norway um, function then using the local wool? And also, uh, does the chain between the farmers, hand spinners, yarn craftsmen and artists, uh, customers, how does that work? Uh, and uh, for the farmers and the textile in industry. And a very important part of this question is, is it supported by the government? Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, also a question around this with, with shep uh, shepherds and practice in Norway, and if uh, we at all use the milk from, from the sheep. Uh, I don't know, would you like to um, explain a little bit around this, uh, Inge? Yes, I can do. And I can also tell you that uh, we actually made a speech about this in English, uh, Tone and I, at the National Museum, uh, at a wool um, um, event there. Um, and we have also tried to explain this earlier, uh, also written in English. Uh, but I will try to explain. Uh, it's a rather complicated story. Um, if we start uh, with the, the end here, uh, and that is if it's supported. Yes, it is. Um, the, uh, the collecting system in Norway is functioning like that the government gives money um, through the collection system uh, to the farmers for the wool. And that is the reason why it's so good, <laughs> because uh, the low price on wool uh, um, raw materials in, um, in Europe uh, is then compensated uh, by uh, subsidies in the Norwegian system. So this is um, this is really an important question, and I guess something we might uh, have explained if we had had more like one speak about the Norwegian wool system. Uh, yeah, I think it is difficult to develop a good system without any support. 
because of the way that textiles are so low priced. So the, diff the difficulties in the competition with the low priced synthetics and imported um, fibers. Um, so that is um, uh, like this. And then it comes to this with, with, with how, how the wool is used in Norway. Um, when Tuna and I started to work with the wool value chain, and that is like 15 years ago, uh, the use of the wool in Norway, the Norwegian wool, was going down. Um, and we did have some, we had knitting yarns, yes, uh, but uh, most of the Norwegian wool was scoured in uh, in UK and also used in other countries. Uh, uh, a lot of it was used for carpets. Uh, it has very good properties for carpets, strong and, and curly. Um, so it's, it, it wasn't a bad um, product for Norwegian wool, but anyway, it wasn't used in Norway, not supporting really the Norwegian value chain uh, beside the knitting yarn. And uh, the cruise project we worked with, and also before that other projects, uh, we tried to change it, uh, uh, this, and we actually managed it much more than we thought was possible. And uh, that is not necessarily only because of us and our uh, work. Uh, others contributed a lot, uh, and maybe it was time for it, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the results is that today, uh, we have a lot more ready-made products in Norwegian wool than we had 15 years ago. We have uh, woven materials in um, furnitures. We have shoes. Or we have uh, ready-made garments, not only uh, knitted. And we, um, and we have more uh, spinners and more variety of knitted yarn, uh, knitting yarn. And also new factories making uh, knitting uh, with whole garment knitting, as as you did see an example of. So uh, it has changed, um, and today um, we have a, a lack uh, of the best um, or the highest priced kind of wool, um, the white wool um, of uh, of a high quality for clothing. So we do actually have less wool than uh, it's uh, than buyers of Norwegian wool in Norway uh, for making products uh, to the Norwegian market, and also we do have spinners that sell um, Norwegian wool um, products uh, abroad, uh, both knitted sweaters uh, and yarn, and other products. So we do have some export, um, but when it comes to uh, wool in general. I would say that the Norwegians, as are as many others, uh, great uh, merino lowers and uh, underwear and a lot of other things, of course, are made of merino. And the production of merino in Norway is so little that you can count it, uh, you know, on, uh, on one hand. Uh, I, I think it's more or less one farm and maybe a few uh, animals, other places, but it's very, very little. And the merino wool production in Norway is also not really the same as merino production other places. And as mentioned um, uh, during, uh, I can't now remember who are you that talked about it, but this, um, this um, um, market now that people think that everything has to be soft to be nice, like soft equal nice. Uh, th this is is quite an interesting thing, and Tone and I has worked a lot with the merino industry. We work closely with the Australian Wool Innovation and the International Wool Trade Organization, which is also, of course, very much a merino based uh, group of people. So we know the merino uh, trade and the merino production. We have been in Australia and South Africa and South America and looked at all these factories and, and production sites. And um, so we know about uh, the merino wool history. And it's uh, amazing how this softness equal uh, quality, softness equal nice, it isn't natural. Uh, it is actually an uh, outcome of a very, very um, bevist, um, uh, targeted 
campaign for making people believe that. Uh, and I think that's an interesting thing to remember, that to to appreciate a Merino as soft, as nice, is actually an outcome of a very uh, strategic um, campaign. Marketing. Yeah, marketing. and it's yeah. marketing campaign, yes. And the one of the slogans is no finer feeling. You know, yeah, and that's uh, that. This is this is marketing history, and I think that it is interesting how we, as human beings, uh, our feelings and how we we experience things, and and f you know whether we appreciate something as warm or interesting, soft, or you know all all these nice, you know, our feelings is also something we learn. Uh, it's not only physical, it's not only natural. And this is something to remember because when it's made by humans, it can also be changed by humans. So it's good to know that that this is this is it isn't uh, only a natural thing. Um, yes, so uh, I talk now a lot, but I think I answered the question, didn't I? So yes, Norway is importing a lot of wool and many of our, our wool factories are only using merino, making underwear, making, you know, mm -hmm. uh, more modern clothing. But when it comes uh, to, uh, to the use of the Norwegian wool, we do have um, we do have actually lack of the best or the highest quality, mm -hmm. if you can call it like that. When it comes I would to... like to know, I would like to know more about, because you just place over a very important point uh, in there and that's Shepherds and how did you manage in those 15 years <laughs> to change the situation i'm sure that it's a long story <laughs> but what were kind of you know the cornerstones of um if, if the situation was different 15 years ago what did you have to do yeah, so. that's uh, another big question. First of all, I have to say again that it wasn't only us. It was uh, a true cooperation. Uh, and we were, uh, you know, we were together. Uh, uh, but we did get money for having the project from the research council in, in Norway, which helped a lot. And then uh, what we did uh, was uh, to like stitch together uh, uh, different spinners, uh, small ones, uh, like Ingvild was very important, but also a bigger one called uh, Hillesvog. Uh, you will find um, the website ull.no, which was very, very supportive uh, and important because they also have more wool. Uh, so they could, you know, contribute with with uh, uh, more wool for, for festivals, for, you know, for um, more marketing and so on. Um, and uh, we did a lot of uh, speeches around the whole Norway. We did write uh, several books about knitting history, about Norwegian wool and yarn, and we made a, a, a wool um, a wool book. Call it a knitting book. And yeah, so we we actually worked both with with consumers and with. Uh, farmers in in into uh, at the same time and also with stitching the the value chain together and I think that the the, the fact that we were situated differently I mean me as a researcher Tuna as a journalist uh, Ingvild and others in industry um, and also um, researchers working with 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 breeding with with um, farming. Uh, so we like uh, work together. Uh, so I think that was one of the reasons uh, we have written about this, you know, success story uh, in the in the book uh, value. No, the book um, local, slow and sustainable wool as a fabric for change. And if some of one, some of you uh, have problem accessing the book, just you know, tell us and we will help you. Uh, you can read about the book at our website, but we can send it if you have problems. Um, so I um, I think it was a lot of different things that made it happen. But I can also say that we didn't rest. I mean, we were on mission all the time. 
and uh, traveling around, talking, writing in the newspapers, talking in the radio, you know, it was like a, a constant uh, education uh, of, of the Norwegian population. But I mean, we are not very many and we are very outspoken, some of us. Um, so it, it helped. Uh, uh, and maybe it's difficult for us to to tell this story. Uh, maybe it's it more, you know, people standing outside would see it differently. But I think it is, it's like a mixture of maybe the time was right and maybe we are. Are more than uh, more than many people um, energetic, <laughs> and maybe they also in the beginning had like a position that made it possible both the industry and the uh, research part of this. So maybe so that was a lot of uh, answers to the question, and still I have two uh, part you. left of the question that was the uh, the um, she shepherd um, and also the um, um, uh, yes and. Today, uh, we don't um, go with uh, the sheep. And the sheep in Norway are in general left in the mountains and in the woods to graze in the summertime. And the reason why this is possible is, of course, that we don't make uh, milk products. And that is also a big, big, big difference between Norway and Slovakia, but also Norway and, and much of, of Europe. Because uh, our meat our sheep production is a meat production today. It used to be a wool production, but today wool is the you know the second um, uh, product of this production. Uh, so the farmers has more uh, uh, money from meat than from uh, uh, skin and 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 uh, wool. Uh, but um, uh, so the uh, sheep are. Uh, of course, looked after either by uh, by you know by the farmer or also electronically uh, with the things around their neck. But you, if you are in Norway in summertime, you will see sheep uh, in the mountains grazing or in the woods grazing, and we have a lot of uh, areas that are open, so we don't have uh, fences, so they are not locked by fences, and this is actually different also from our neighbor countries. Uh, so we have like the farms are fenced so that the, the sheep can't enter the farms. They they sometimes want to go home, but they can't because they're really locked out. So the the um, after being outside in, in the woods and mountains, they will be allowed into graze uh, at home at the farms before, you know, in the in the autumn when when the when it's less to eat uh, in the mountains and the and the woods, but this system is rather new. And if you go back in history, we also used to go with the sheep, and that's another history. So it's this has changed. So today the sheep are really, really you know kind of independent animals. <laughs> they go with their mothers and they go in smaller flocks, quite small flocks. And and uh, it's a different landscapes around in Norway. So of course, this system is also a bit different. For instance, at the coast, where they might also go, you know, close to the seaside. Uh, but it is quite um, independent life for Norwegian sheep uh, today. Does, does and it mean you... because of this, uh, we also slaughter only in or not only, but mainly in autumn. Uh, so all the sheep will be, the, the lambs will be born or supposed to be born very short period of time in the spring before they go out uh, to graze. So that means that when the lambs are slaughtered, they have really not been much at the farm at all. They are, you know, they have been in in the in the, uh, in the woods and the mountains and. Mm -hmm. Uh, we work now with with making sure that this system is uh, is used and not give that the the the, um, the sheep aren't given to too much uh, you know food at the farms uh, because it's much better uh, to use the huge grazing possibilities in Norway and if it's our land isn't grazed it will uh, grow uh, back to wood to 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 forest land. And uh, that's, you know, um, problematic um, 
change of our landscape. Uh, we can also talk much about. Uh, so, yeah, but this is kind of an answer. No milk production or very, very, very little and a lot, and grazing uh, not at the farm. We have two raised hands from the um, participants. Yes, uh, maybe we should take Eva first because we haven't heard your, your voice before and then uh, Simon can go afterwards. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Hello, my name is uh, Eva Vobrova uh, and I'm from the Czech Republic. And first of, first of all, I really thank you for this uh, webinar because it's great because the Czech wool market has the same problem as the Slovak one. So all the things we are talking about are very very similar to us. I would like to um, uh, ask you um, also for the possible cooperation because uh, we are organizing uh, on the uh, autumn um, um, the fair uh, in Prague, uh, which is called uh, Textile Handcrafts uh, Live and Modern, because I am trying to react on the, on the here in the Czech Republic. Um, uh, the spinning and the wool is really connected to the old times, to past times, uh, to museums and all, all these things. A lot of women are sitting by the old uh, spinning wheels uh, and thinking about wool is something what is just in the past times, what was in the past times. And I really see it when I'm spinning uh, for the public that people are coming and they are telling us that we are uh, some uh, creatures from the fairy tales. <laughs> and that's very that's very strange because I know that um, uh, all around the world that this situation is uh, is different. And um, um, I'm glad that uh, it took just 15 years to change the situation. <laughs> because, yes, I feel that we have a lot of work, but uh, there is um, a vision that it could work also here too. For me, the 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 the, the point, the main point is that um, when you say Norwegian wool, then I feel the essence of the wool. You know, Norwegian landscapes, knitting. Uh, uh, um, and all these things, but uh, I think this is similar also for the Slovakian wool. This is the question of essence of of our wool. What 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 is the what what is the the, the topic for the communication? What is the the body and the soul? Uh, what um, what do we what, what what is the attraction of the of the Czech wool? Because I started to communicate separately with uh, Czech sheep breeders uh, to really find the quality wool for spinners and invite them to our action, uh, to our fair, and they have no interest because it costs money and uh, for them it's not um, acceptable to communicate with a single people. So that's why I'm really surprised to hear that you have some collective center and you are doing this uh, all all the breeders can 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 buy the wool together and government is supporting this so f for me is this really really very important uh, uh, point so i don't want to talk uh, <laughs> much even i have a lot of minds but uh, i would like to ask you if i can contact you personally uh, to start really cooperation not just with uh, slovakian spinners but also with czech ones because we are also uh, thinking about the Czech uh, non-profitable organization. Um, so um, that is my, my my question, if there is, you think there's the opportunity also to cooperate. Yes, thank you, Eva, for your uh, for your comments and questions. And uh, and also, uh, I mean, I, I have heard this before. And I, I know, I mean, Tuna and I have also explained the Norwegian system for Swedes, for instance. They don't have this collection system that we do have in Norway. So it's like um, a lot of places that a lot of things are lacking to make sure that this very valuable uh, resource is taken hand off. So yes, thank you. Um, we um, should have started to talk about uh, the future now, and slowly we actually have done without, you know, making a break from the questions and into the more future discussion. Uh, and I can, I don't know whether uh, Simon, if that's your comment, maybe you should take your now before we we try to 
to answer that. Maybe, on, maybe on I'll lead system. on to future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many of us are looking at new initiatives to start up new collection centers with sorting and grading to better supply European markets with wool that we know is of a certain characteristic, microns, length, etc. My original question would be how accessible would Norway be to a wool collection center, small wool collection centers, collecting, grading, sorting and grading wool? Is it accessible in the Norwegian market? Could a small producer, for example, a Slovak-based uh, collection center, realistically look to Norway as a potential market? Uh, because it's all right, well and good creating collection centers, but we have to send the wool somewhere. Uh, how easy you and accessible is the market for the small? Um, the market for yarn or the market for wool? Well, no, presumably, we once we've done a collection center, we've collected the shorn wool, we've got it sorted, graded, uh, and that, that will go on to scouring with the, uh, in response to an order from a mill. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it, how would it work getting it to Norway? How would it work getting it around Europe? Because at the moment, it's so easy, like possibly what the Norwegians do now, is when your wool is being scoured in Bradford, you just add the extra wool you need and it comes in as a big shipment to the mill. You know, it's so easy just to go shopping for wool in Bradford. How can we change that, that they go shopping for wool around Europe? <laughs> yeah, um, but then uh, the scouring is the problem, isn't it? I mean, we don't have uh, we don't have scouring, big scale scouring in Norway. So we... Uh, with, I mean, like the rest of the Europe, it's very concentrated, the bigger scouring uh, system. I mean, we send our wool to uh, to Brad, but not the smallest one. They can scour themselves, I think we'll explain, but, but, uh, but we don't have, uh, now we don't have a scouring uh, facility as in, in many other countries. So uh, that's why we have the wool market from... Uh, Sorry. Um, yeah, but maybe I didn't understand. I uh, did you think about having the wool spun like in Norway? Well, yeah, we we, we can we can collect wool, grade wool, sort wool. Mm -hmm. We can even arrange for it to be scoured mm -hmm. if for the smaller collector. But the what do we do with it then? Yeah. As a uh, I would say. I mean, this is of course a question that Ingvil could answer better than me. Uh, but the thing is that the market for yarn has been quite good in Norway. Uh, so um, the spinners in Norway has been spinning and spinning and spinning, spinning day and night. Uh, and uh, and uh, so they some of them has actually been uh, growing uh, in size and others actually have, uh, we have also small new ones coming up. And it doesn't seem to be that the market for yarn, especially knitting yarn, has like a limited and we have, uh, I can't remember the figures now, but the, if you look at how much knitting yarn that is sold in Norway and how many people we are, we use a lot of sweaters. <laughs> but anyway, if you don't store the wool then. But uh, maybe Ingvil, maybe you could uh, answer Simon better on this question. Well, actually, uh, I think you got the point here that we, we spin all the time <laughs> as much as we can. But still, uh, I'm thinking ahead that maybe there is a limit even in Norway. Uh, so what we try to do is to uh, find people to cooperate with that is using our yarn for other things also than hand knitting. So that's why I was talking about this 3D knitter and uh, uh, I could tell about other examples. Uh, we also like to cooperate with the weavers and... Uh, uh, things like that, but but we also do take uh, wool from other countries to to spin. We have been we spun for Poland, of course, in the in the volume project. I have been spinning from the Faroe Islands, and we have spun quite a lot for Sweden before they got their own mini mills. So and and we do it as a test. If someone wants to, we can uh, spin from wool from other countries countries as a test and we also work as a mini lab for the larger spinning mills and spinning mills in Norway 
uh, and that's quite fun when we get to cooperate with them. <laughs> we like that. I don't know if that was really the answer of the questions. The, I, I don't see any problems with the importing uh, scoured wool to Norway, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, if I may indulge, because I have to disappear in a second, a little advert. Uh, we're trying to put together uh, what is called a cost action uh, proposal to the European Union to be sub submitted in October, which is basically the first sort of cost action that will be done in the wool sector. And basically you're all at all levels invited to participate in that proposal. Uh, basically it's a project that allows exchange and discussion, dissemination of information, it will be led by uh, academic institutions uh, and the larger industry players, we hope. Uh, you're all very much invited to express an interest if you want to participate in that. Uh, and if we were successful, we'd have five years of funding to spend lots of time having discussions. Uh, Ingram, I sent you an email today about that. So, uh, but yes. Yes, thank you, I did see. So any anybody at any level is well in well we need all levels for that uh, program to succeed so uh, ever is taking part but it would likely to be a Greek university that is the leader uh, because we need a an academic uh, leader in it and they 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 propose the idea so anybody can jump and join us contact us through ever or I'll put an email in in the chat boxes and so if you want any information. Please drop me a line. What, what type of call is it, Simon? Sorry? What type of call is it? It's called a cost action. Uh, it funds, it basically, they fund up to maybe a million euros to facilitate exchange, innovation exchange, dialogue exchange between uh, academics, research, and so that that information filters through to industry and through to end users. So it's a dissemination process uh, and the EU runs it every year and uh, there's never been one in the wool sector. Yes, it's a very good idea, Simon. And I'm, I, I, I'm sure we will, um, we will send you an email. And um, oh. I have been uh, following just, you know, from the outside, another cost program that has been in textile history and uh i think it is it's it is not much really um money for research but it is more money for doing things together um kind of um, yeah it's dialogue so yeah yeah it's spreading the word yes um but that is also uh, very um, helpful um and it needs a lot of different countries. And I think that is very specific about the cost, that it's, it's not only one place. It's like uh, the more, the better. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. It has to be seven countries. Exactly. Um, but we you know we would target having as many as possible. Mm -hmm. so. we, could, we could add all these links to some show notes uh, when we um, both produce the webinar. And uh, everything that was mentioned that could lead on another cooperation, we could add to the show notes below the video. Right? Yep. Yes. Uh, now we have more or less used our time, haven't we? So it's time to, to close down. Uh, we didn't reach uh, to talk about all possibilities. Whether, whether it will be new calls uh, for uh, grants uh, from the EER um, system, for instance. Uh, of course, we will follow that up. Um, and uh, we will also make like a report from the webinar today. And we hope also to make the webinar um, recording available. Um, and uh, as I've said, uh, at the clothing research website, uh, you will find all uh, the wool uh, research from uh, from the project that I have mentioned, the volume project and the cruise project and so on. And you can press the wool button and you will find the 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 the, the different kind of uh, things. And if it's something that is difficult uh, or you didn't find or you have questions really, 
then you also can send us email. And of course, you'll find our email address at the Clothing Research website. So uh, then I think I will end the webinar. And there's, I there's one small there's a comment. I think it's from Simon. These are very worthwhile meetings. Any chance of some more very soon? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, uh, not very soon, I think, because uh, we have other things to do very soon. <laughs> but uh, I agree. I, I, I think it was nice to see you all. And I know that if you all should have met, you know, in reality, it would be a lot, lot of work, uh, you know. So it is an opportunity to sometimes meet, uh, not in in um, reality, but just on, on the computer. So it is a good opportunity. Um, yes, so again, uh, we'll uh, end with the thanking for the money from the EEA, Norway and Switzerland. And uh, we will thank all the people that has contributed uh, with the English word and Slovakian language and nice pictures and questions. And I hope to see you all and uh, next time, maybe with a real hug uh, as well. So thank you and have a nice weekend. I thank you all too, uh, especially from Slovakian side to the Norwegian side, because uh, if you didn't push us a bit into the project, we would probably never done it ourselves, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so thank you for these uh, starters and let's see where it brings us. And we are looking forward to any other cooperation. Thank you. It's already set up for the mountains, right? <laughs> Enjoy the mountains. We are going to the mountains now. <laughs> so I'm in the car. Thank you all. <laughs> Bye-bye, then. Goodbye, all, and thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>